What is going on, diehards? Happy Monday to you all. Welcome back to the Die Hard MMA Podcast. I'm your host, as always, your boy Clinton. Oh, that was uh that was a rough night in Atlantic City, wasn't it? What the, what the hell was that, man? I'm having such a hot like it's two days later, and I'm still having a hard time wrapping my brain around all the chaos that we saw. I call these fight nights dumpster fires, right? And and it's a little tongue in cheek. I love me some MMA. I don't care if it's mid to low level. I'll watch it. I'll bet on it. But what was that? Absolutely unreal. Oh, let's welcome in the chat first and foremost. My guy Dream right off the hook. What is up, my guy? Colby Saul in the house. It's booty hanging out. Ethan. Hershey, my guy, thank you. He kept his word for those of you who didn't see it. He did his shoey. He posted it up on Twitter. Thank you again for the friendly bet, my guy. VGO in the house. What is up? Dix Insider hanging out. C Dell, the grateful dude. Mushroom MMA and MMA goats. People are starting to roll in. We're getting cracking here. Love to see it. Thank you all for being here what's up everybody and welcome back into the show we've got a brand new week of fights to talk about coming off a eight unit down type of night but man it's one of those ones where uh you swing shooter's gonna shoot you know what i mean every once in a while you just gotta you just gotta take your shot and i took my shot and it bit me right in the ass but yeah you know what guys i have got to I've got to recap this last card. I know normally we just kind of like brush over the last week's card and we move on to this week, but too much happened. Way too much happened for us to just not talk about it. I mean, so first and foremost, um, Callan Lawford, Angel Pacheco, round one was pretty dang close. And Pacheco actually started like busting up the nose of Lawford. So, I jumped in. I threw a one unit live bet on Pacheco at plus 500 because I'm like, it looks like the striking is starting to turn. He is the bigger guy at Bantamweight. I'm not seeing Lawford grapple. I'm like, this is, that was an easy trigger pull for me to be like, you know, I was contemplating it around the plus 300 mark. I'm getting plus 500 and Lawford's going to start choking on his blood the deeper this fight goes. And uh, nope. Cal Lofren pulled a high fight IQ move and in round two switched it up and took it to the ground immediately. <laughs> that was that was one of those live bets where you just feel the pit of your stomach sink right after making it because you're like, son of a bitch. Like, I I really thought we were going to keep striking in round two. Lofren, I thought we were going to keep striking in round two. But no. Uh, so Pacheco gets absolutely schooled in round two, needs a finish in round three. But by that point, he's way too tired. Lofren masterful performance if we're being honest like he had a little bit of uh, a tough go to start that round one and it was all one-sided traffic from there so you know i don't mind throwing a little bit of a dart early and going down with the ship it is what it is i dodged a freaking bullet though because if you guys recall i said if you blind bet every single dog on this card i think you end up profitable i gotta go back and do the math i think that was true I actually think that might have been accurate based on what happened on this card. But I want to math it up and see whether or not I was actually correct. I almost bet Andre Petrowski. I've had such a tough history with this guy. And uh, I am very grateful for that rough history because I'm like, no matter what happens, if I bet on Petrowski, he loses. He just dies. Suddenly. Like It's the weirdest thing. If I bet on Petrowski, he gets killed. And if I'm not on Petrowski or if I bet against him, God forbid, he looks like a million bucks or he snatches somebody's neck or something insane. It was the weirdest thing I think we've ever seen. Like the number one all-time weirdest thing to happen in a UFC cage. Petrowski knocks himself out on Jacob Malkoon's hip. 
I mean, he like bull in a china shop, dives in for a blast double, and when he can't quite scoop the legs of Malcoon, he just falls over. It's like, what was that? Like, we we know Malcoon's got no power, right? We talked about that. The Cody Brundage DQ, where he's just being pestered by the ground and pound shots to the back of his head, and nobody's actually really hurt, but we got away with it anyway. Like, we know there's absolutely zero force behind the punches of Jacob Malcoon. So there's no way he got, with like this much space, there's no way he generated enough force to knock out Andre freaking Petrowski. He did it to his damn, you know what I figured out? I think you see all those videos of like the Chi masters. They're like these old fat dudes that are like spinning in their dojos and all their students are like falling off of them. I think Jacob Malcoon is a Chi master. This man has been slowly sneaking his way up into the UFC and developing the secret technique on the side. People are just going to start dying in the cage in front of him, and he's just going to be like, <laughs> I can't. I can't get over it. I can't get over the celebration either. Like, the way this man, like, roared and every vein in his body popped out so it was visible that he just knocked some. Bro, you didn't even do anything. You did nothing. Oh my gosh. That one's going to take me a long time to get over. And I know we say it regularly, but it's like, I, I don't think that one's going to get topped. I know I'm wrong. It's the sport of MMA. Something else insane is going to eventually happen to top this one. But that's number one, and I think it's going to take a while before something crazy beats it. Um, Ibo Aslan and Anton Turkali. I didn't want Turkali. I was kind of on the Abo Aslan side, but I also was very concerned when this got into round two because even though Abo Aslan looked like he was, he was kind of like pacing himself, making sure he had enough time and energy in this one, um, it looked like he was starting to get tired again. I thought Turkali was going to take over. I really did. And you've got arguably an early stoppage when Ibo blasts Turkali with a big right hand. Turkali just kind of dumbfounded looking up at him. Didn't even really get a chance to defend himself. I don't know. That one could have gone either way. Um, I bet Connor Matthews, bad bet, I guess, in hindsight. Dennis Bazooka by low spot was always the way. And these sons of bitches, they, I only listen to a few other shows, you guys. I, I just don't have time, unfortunately, with all the research work and content and stuff like that that I do. I only listen to a few other shows, but the ones I did listen to scared the shit out of me on Herbert Burns. So I ended up hedging my parlay with one unit shot on Herbert Burns, thinking, you know, I expect Julio Arce should still get the win, but I've got like a nice two unit middle as long as Bill Aljo wins. And we'll get to that because that was supposed to be easy money, but Herbert Burns does Herbert Burns, dies in round two. I argued... For Verna Janzaroba, I talked about how Loopy can never be trusted at this price tag. Did I get to the window? No, I did not. Sure enough, Verna goes ahead and gets out there and gets the decision. Nate, the train, may be my best call on the entire card. Because I told you guys, Nate has this weird ability that if you hurt him, but don't finish him, it's like he gets the superstar in Mario. Like, he is never touchable from that point forward ever again throughout the fight. He just massacres people. You rock him once, and if you don't put the nail in the coffin, you're dead man walking. And, and Jamal Emmers found that out the hard way. Uh, Reese McKee, Chitty and Jaquati going the full distance. Chitty somehow having cardio at 170 pounds. Baffling to me. Um, dodged a bullet there, thank God. And then Bill Aljo and Kyle Nelson. I mean, this one's tough because you guys know me. I'm all for fighter safety. I'm all for, for protecting the fighters from themselves. But he was still defending, man. He was still up and he was wobbled, but he was still like egging on Kyle Nelson and he was getting his back to the cage. And he, I hate the judges on this card, man, or the, the officials. I absolutely hate. So my parlay that I really needed goes down in flames to Kyle Nelson again, of all people. He's got me three times in a row, guys. I mean, like the next time Kyle Nelson fights, I just have to pass. Like, I know he's going to lose the next one, right? But I was confident he was going to lose the last two. So I don't know what the hell is going on with this guy. He's he's running so hot right now. He's got a horseshoe up his ass, and there's nothing I can do about it. And then I'm, I'm going to piss you guys off just a little bit. I'm going to make you mad. Um, the Cedric Dumas and Nurse Sultan Razaboev fight. I ran this tape back, I think, three different times. So you guys all called me insane in the first place for betting on Cedric Dumas. I get it. I get it. I get it. Um, 
but rewatch that fight. The number one thing anybody's got to say is, oh, he went one for 16 on strikes, bro. He didn't look good. You guys realize this is a 15-minute fight, right? He's taking on a guy who's got 30 round one finishes, who, by the way, doesn't win fights if it gets out of round one. He took Razabov's best shot. He took his best shot twice. And then Razabov stops hitting him. You watch the next two, three combos that he throws, and they're whiffing. Dumas was getting the timing. Dumas was getting the distance. And he was, like, crashing into him with his forearms and, like, resetting the space. And then right before the eye poke, Dumas actually started unloading with his offense. He actually started going forward. There was, like, You guys, that was the tide turning. That fight was just getting started. And I hate MMA because they're never going to run that fight back. And I will die on this hill that Dumas was about to take over that fight. And he was going to come back and he was going to beat the brakes off of Nur Sultan Razabov. I can't wait because I'm going to continue betting on Cedric Dumas. And I'm going to continue fading Nur Sultan Razabov. This is a bump in the road, but that shit's going to work. I'm telling you. Um, eye pokes. More eye pokes. Chris Wyman, guys. So, okay. So, that fight should have been a no contest, right? I should have got my five-unit bet refunded to me because of the eye poke. I should have lost my two-unit bet on Chris Wyman because that shit should have been a DQ. I don't care that it ended up being a technical decision. I won the money. Hooray me. I go one and one on eye pokes. But the amount of times Chris Wyman poked Bruno Silva in the eyes, like that poor guy they probably should have disqualified chris wyman thank god i bet on the hometown guy and a legend like chris they're never going to do that to him in his backyard so i'll take the money there but dear god um buckley came through like a million bucks that one felt fantastic first bet of the night should have been the league memorial dog of the week but i ended up flipping to dumas so we take an l there and then congrats to everybody who had men off your row because uh I thought the the later that fight went, the more Aaron Blanchfield was going to start like chipping chipping away at her. This card, guys, I, I like I mentioned before, I call them dumpster fires. I've got a lot of restaurant experience. When I was younger, I worked in restaurants for a long time, paying through college. And if you guys if you guys work in restaurants, you'll know what I'm talking about. The, every once in a while, they'll ask you to take out the trash, and you just walk out back and you chuck it in the dumpster, and it's it's just kind of part of your gig, right? But then every once in a while. Every once in a while, you'll take the trash out back, and when you open the lid to the dumpster, there's a couple of hobos in there that grab you head first and yank you in. They bend you over, and then no one believes you, so you have to go back in and finish your shift. That's what this podcast feels like. I got bent over by a couple of hobos in a dumpster, and now I have to finish my shift. And with that, I'm going to welcome in an absolute legend in the space. You have been waiting for this guy to grace the camera. My guy, Cody freaking Saptic. What's up, man? How you doing? Clint, my man. It was actually really cool just sitting there listening to you chat, uh, chat and do your thing and I, i've known you for a long time like i'm thinking like seven or eight years at this point we've been having interactions uh you know talking uh, of course beyond just like social media stuff you got my cell phone number we talk outside of this game as well you're generally a good guy i never realized how much you sound like chael son and i'm sure you get that all the time um, i have never gotten that have you never gotten that bro just i get i look here like anthony listening. smith but i i've never got the chael son in before <laughs> you sound like chael son especially when you get passionate and fired up so yeah last weekend's card was most definitely a two hobo gangbang in a dumpster <laughs> things not going good uh you got pretty much everything everything you're talking about i agree only thing is continue if you'd like to fade ruse above going forward but stop betting on cedric dumas man like, he's, <laughs> he's generally not good not good not good fighter poor ring iq skills are themselves not good so i'm thinking he gets cut soon and if you want to bet him on like dan levy will take him in the nfc or something then maybe it makes sense but at the ufc level they're not going to give him any layups and i don't think he's got any type of elite skill so yeah last weekend could have should have would have could have gone a lot better but uh, that's in the past brother we are in the present you said it best, man. It's uh, It's been kind of an up and down story for me this year. I was on like a three event win streak with just like one little baby L weaseled in there. Could have been a four event win streak type of thing. And then this one laid a massive egg. So I got some work to do, man. Um, don't want to don't want to pe leave the people hanging any further. We got fights to talk about, man. Let's get right on into it, everybody. Do me a favor. Hit the like button. You already know Cody, so make sure you follow him on socials. If you haven't, this is Home of Fight, and let's get into it. First fight of the night, we've got Melissa Mullins taking on Nora Cornoli. Cornell Cornoli. I think I did this last time. It's Cornoli. Um, <laughs> man, Mullins used to be Melissa Dixon. Okay, so for those of you who are like, who the hell is this? 
Used to be Melissa Dixon. Won an over in her, uh, in her UFC run so far over Alex Siva. That's the Russian Ronda chick that she beat the brakes off of. She's 32 years old. She's 6-0. and And I'll be honest, man. I thought Alex Siva was going to drag her to the mat and snap her arm like she kind of has done to everybody else. So I was right there swimming along with everybody in that crowd. But I like what I saw from Melissa in that fight. Good measured pace, nice jab, decent boxing. And she had Alex Eva's face busted up pretty quick too, man. So for women's MMA, not so bad on the power side of things either. Uh, I like the way she climbed her way up into mount. She's got a big right hand, good elbows and ground and pound when she gets on top. I'm thinking I'm kind of okay here with Miss uh, Miss Melissa Mullins. Now, Norda Conol, 7-1, and one, 34 years old. Oh, boy, she won her UFC debut <laughs> against Jocelyn Edwards. Um, that was one where, man, I I ran that back, and I really don't think she won that fight. Jocelyn Edwards is, uh, is getting memed left and right. Either she's robbing people on the scorecards or she's getting robbed one way or the other. Um, I'm not a big fan of Nora. She's, she's older. She's 34. And you look at her run and a lot of her knockouts and stuff like that, man, they're just – they're just bad. They're early stoppages. They're over soccer moms. They're awkward. Like, I, I don't know what she's good at. She's 34, 7, and 1, and she's good in the clinch. L like, I like her knees and her elbows in the clinch, but that that's kind of about it. She's physically strong. She's got bad cardio. This seems like a pretty easy Melissa Mullins spot to me, man. Am I missing something? Yeah, no, no. I completely agree with you on all those points. With Cornoli, as you keep mentioning, 34 years old, didn't have any quality victories before signing with the UFC. So it's like, well, why was she in the UFC to begin with? Is there any type of redeeming factor to her? Is there any type of back class that we're maybe missing? It's like, no, the UFC went to Paris, France. As such, they need fighters from France. And she gets signed as a result of that. So the fight with Jocelyn Edwards, she was like, Pretty much even money, slight underdog, I suppose. And Jocelyn Edwards has fought in the UFC. She's the American fighter. She's going over to enemy territory. She lands five takedowns and pretty much controls the entirety of the fight. But she did not land anything. So by the striking numbers, she got outstruck like 40 to 12 against Cornoli, who sp spent the vast majority of the fight on her back or largely getting controlled. So Edwards is definitely faulty, as you mentioned. She's either robbing somebody or getting robbed. It just speaks to the nature of her style, which is not a whole lot of finishes, kind of grindy, a lot of time spent in the clinch. It's going to allow a hometown fighter to just land a few more strikes, and the crowd gives you a little bit of a pop, and now people are on your side. You get the you get the nod. So, yeah, I thought Edwards won that fight. I bet Edwards in that spot. Wasn't a great performance by Cornoli. At 34, you're not going to see any type of improvements from her. You might see her a little bit more comfortable second outing in the UFC. But now you go from a raucous hometown crowd fighting in your own backyard in a live arena to coming over to the Apex in Las Vegas. Ooh, different fucking vibe. And I think, yeah, I, I don't expect some largely improved version of her. Mullins, meanwhile, Mullins has got quality victories. Again, so 32 but in her case, it's like, yeah, she's more refined. She's not one of these 24-year-old prospects who look good on tape and let the, the moment get to them. She's come out. She's had some quality victories over on the regional scene. And you'll note, uh, you'll see noticeably that fight with uh, Daria Zenla Sokova, who fought in the UFC, I guess, two weeks ago, right? And in that fight, it's like, oh, man, she's getting boxed up standing. She's getting hit standing. As soon as she gets to the fight to the ground, she takes over. As you mentioned, strong mount, strong ground game, strong pressure. But also, she's like a tank engine. She can go hard 15, and she just, just like that steam, she builds up, she builds up, she builds up. So in that fight, a little, little bit of adversity, but she takes over and she wins clean on the scorecards. The Arena Lexiva fight in her UFC debut is much of the same. She gets knocked down. She doesn't have a particularly good first round, but she just keeps going. She just keeps building off it. Even prior to that, her win over uh, Rizlan Zuak on Aries FC. Rizlan Zuak is a judo black belt. Solid credentials for a regional fight. Your, your fourth pro fight. You're taking on a 10-fight pro veteran with a quality judo black belt. And again, you see a decision fight, but someone that's going to be able to go out there, not gas on you, keep going. If she has a bad first round, don't worry about it. Don't rip up your betting ticket. <laughs> she'll continuously get better yeah but that happens in horse racing all the time it's like oh, i'm done and you rip it and then the horse comes back like fuck never rip it never, never rip the rip ticket it. <laughs> now it's all digital you can't rip the ticket but the saying stands true you yeah. could lose the first round with mullins dixon whatever you want to refer to her as you can lose the first round and know that she's going to fight for your dollar and continue to get better so women's mma typically is close but in the apex i want the person coming forward doing damage getting on top if she gets knocked down she's going to pop back up and cornoli just got controlled by edwards Dixon could do the same thing if Dixon chooses not to grapple with her and just wants to, you know, crash forward and, and strike. I still think she can win the fight that way. So yeah, we're on I the same. I think the jab will do wonders if she decides to strike even. 
Yeah, multiple paths to victory. So, uh, yeah, yeah, 32 versus 34. It's not even like, oh, she's 32, she's in the prime of her career, and they're throwing her in there with this young, hot Brazilian prospect. It's like they're giving her a 34-year-old girl from France who's not even rated by their own rankings, who <laughs> got signed to the UFC because they were in France, and it was like, oh, we need to bolster this card a bit. Giannis Garamudi got signed <laughs> on that yeah. card, too. Should he have been there? Absolutely not. But they need home bodies, right? So I get it. I get it from a business standpoint. But now what do you do with them in their second fight? You give them to actual legit. It's hard to say that Mullins is a prospect again because she's 32. but And she's only 6-0 and and she's new to the UFC. So you know, from that standpoint, she's still a prospect. And I think yeah. one that does factor in the division. Just give her a few more of these bottom end fights, a mid-level fight. And then she's going to have to start fighting contenders. Absolutely. she's She's got the upside for sure. Yeah kind of gross to go minus 325 on a women's mma fight to start the card but hey sometimes you got to do what you got to do I, I agree man i think that's the side here and cody i on my show every once in a while we like to cater just a little bit to the chat we have a request for you to you know at least comment or see my guy dixon cider's profile picture here i don't know if you know dixon cider but he's a regular uh, on all the uh, streams and MMA shows, and he's got one of the best profile picks in the game. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I think I seen uh, lucrative MMA give a shout out to that the other day. He was kind of like, "Oh, that's my boy Sh Paul Shag." Not the most flattering picture of Paul Shag, <laughs> but I've come to realize when you're doing video, I'm guilty for the same thing. I'll do a shoe and I'll like make a face, and you've got yep. a whole video. You could frame by frame, just take the worst one you want and make anybody in the world look bad. But. uh all the We're same, I, I, here, I don't think they meet him from like a malicious standpoint. So cool that he's given my boy Paul a little bit of love there too. No, no, Dixon. Dixon's one of the good ones, man. He He's in everybody's chat. He's supporting everybody. He's always hitting the like button. Like he's one of the good ones. So it's coming from a good place. All right, let's move on, man. We got some more fights to talk about. Next up, we've got Dylan Budka taking on Cesar Almeida. And this one, I struggled with, Cody. I really did. So it, both these guys, it's kind of the rare double Dana White's Contender Series, right? It's Dana White's Contender Series 2.0. Mm. Both these guys are getting their UFC. Still in the Apex. <laughs> yeah, still in the Apex. Yeah. Just run it, man. Just run it again. Season two. <laughs> Dylan Budka, 7-2. Uh, and two. He's 24 years old, and he is super heavy on his feet, man. Sometimes he rushes in to, like, close the distance, just kind of barrels over people. Decent wrestling. He's short. He's stocky. Uh, I, I like his body lock. You know, he, he goes for the clinch attacks and stuff like that. He, he's strong enough to, like, pick people up and slam them to the ground if he needs to. He did that on the uh, Contender Series in his first fight. Seems like he's a bit of a grinder, right? Um, he's coming out of a gym that I'm not familiar with. Demolition, I believe. I looked at it, and there's, like, a couple LFA guys mixed in there. Nobody really noteworthy that i could tell from that gym so a little bit of a niche crowd there one inch reach advantage here in this spot almeida four and oh 36 years old and i'm scratching my head i'm like why why are they signing this four and old 36 year old bum to the ufc like that's not the contender series mmo that's not what they do on kid this is the guy that's got the win over alex Pereira in kickboxing so he's taking the Pereira. Uh, game plan, if you will, the career path. They're going to give him a couple of scrub grapplers and see if he can hack it in MMA and then see if he can get a couple of wins, but it's kind of a now or never at 36 years old type of thing. On the Contender Series, I wasn't overly impressed with his striking, but he obviously was the better striker, and he did a good job of stuffing takedowns. He did a good job of winding up on top, and once he did get on top, he started hurting the other dude, and his cardio checked out. I mean... Man, this is a spot where I looked at, and very quickly, I was going to bet the grappler. I was like, I want Budka here, obviously. And then I kind of pumped the brakes, and I was like, oh, shit. Okay, I see what's happening here. I think this is a Cesar Almeida spot. Like, they, I'm going to play the narrative here, Cody. I think the UFC wants Almeida to win this fight. I think they gave him a, a grappler who, once again, he's just going to have to stuff a couple takedowns. And then he's going to have miles better striking than he should get a win here, and I think they want him to. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure about that, man. I mean, like, it's it's possible he's 36 years old. You completely nailed it. He needs to get over right away and get that win. They signed him because he's got a win over Alex Pereira, right, from 2013. For the record, he's won two against Alex Pereira, but he does have that win he's from over win. 11 years ago. So since then, he's been kickboxing largely for the glory promotion and back home in his native Brazil and just, like, middling results. He's not a heavy power puncher. He's more of a decision guy. He's just been kickboxing. And then once you realize... You're in your mid-30s, and kickboxing doesn't pay the bills. Unless you're like an elite Rico Verhoeven type, kickboxing ain't paying the bills. At that point, it's like, I got to win over Alex Pereira. And I can see on my TV that he's making million millions of dollars as a UFC champion. So I'm going to use that name cachet 
to get going. If the UFC wanted to just quick route this guy, they have attempted to do the same thing with Gokan Saki. They did the same thing with Alex Pereira himself. You know, Simon Marcus, there was plans to do the same thing with him when he was flirting with the idea of uh, going MMA full-time. You match him up against strikers. Like, why, why would you... Why would you double book him against a wrestler unless you didn't think uh -huh. highly of him? Now, for the record, they originally do book him against Christian Leroy Duncan. Dope fight. Dope fight. Because Christian Leroy Duncan's a striker, fleet-footed, stylish type guy. And you've got a proven commodity, a guy with quality over a decade of quality international kickboxing experience. That's a dope fight. That He pulls out with this like nasty staff infection. They book him a second time around against Josh Frem, who... Went to Slippery Rock University. I mean, does actually come from a wrestling background. Isn't the greatest offensive wrestler going. But that was the booking. Frem gets hurt, and then you got Dylan Budka coming in. I don't rate Dylan Budka. I honestly don't think he's all that good. But again, it does come back to a style clash. And yeah, he's not from the biggest gym. And yeah, he's a little bit short notice. But he's still young. He's 25 years old, 26 years old. Is he even younger? Budka is. Sorry, let me just. 24. Yeah, he's, 20, he's 24 years old, so so another guy that you do expect to see improvements out of. And, I mean, he did wrestle D1 in college, right? He's out of Ohio, which is a notoriously strong wrestling state, and he went to Notre Dame College in Ohio. But still, he comes from that wrestling base. When he fought Chad Hanacom on the U, uh, on the Contender Series, he was a slight favorite. Hanacom is a bruiser from South Africa, very heavy-handed, but not the best defensive wrestler. And then Budkas is just fairly one-dimensional, plotting, comes forward. Like you said, not super impressive. Young, getting better, but right now, not super impressive, but he can get the takedowns, and he's physically strong. He's got a nasty body lock. Once he grips his hands around you, he can just rack up a whole lot of riding time, positional time, right? And that is what kind of leads you to just win rounds. The Hanacom fight, he got only two takedowns. They controlled him largely for the vast majority of it. Never let Chad let his, get his hands going at all, and then ultimately ends up just picking up a decision victory. Only lands like 22 strikes. Not super impressive, but the ability to cling on to your opponent, to me, that was impressive. Cesar Almeida, meanwhile, fights on the contender series. Again, you watch the fight, not, not, not super, you know, it wasn't like his striking look. Oh my God, this guy is world-class talent. Look good. Yeah. He was nervous about the takedown. <laughs> and he still get he still got taken down three times. So Buka's just definitely gonna just try to cling to him and rack up control time in a small little uh a small little cage like the Apex. There's not a whole lot of surface to have to travel. These long rangey kickboxing type strikers, not that he's long and rangey, but he wants to play that distance game. He wants to play to the outside. He wants to point fight, so to speak, because he's not a big knockout guy. He wants space to operate with. Small cage is going to favor Budka. The ability for Budka's coaches to convey their messages very clearly because there's no live crowd should favor Budka. There's a problem that I get to when I go to hit it that he's the favorite. It's like I wanted an even money or slight underdog Budka. But yeah. to think that he's like minus 140, minus 150, I'm not really into it. Because again, you short notice, he's not very good. And like the one path that I can foresee him utilizing to win, which I think he does utilize for the record, it, it, it's, you know, it's not the prettiest. Cling on to the guy and land 22 strikes. Even bad judges might be like, oh, Jocelyn They're Edwards. not giving that anymore, man. She got five takedowns and a whole bunch of control time. But it's like, if, you, if you're not smashing the guy with ground and pound, and the problem with these one-dimensional wrestlers is they're so worried about letting their hands go to land the punches because they know their opponent's going to get up that they'd prefer just to keep it clasped and control the time some more. You're playing a dangerous game because you're probably going to decision and you're leaving it subjective to the judges. So Budka's not a really guy that I'd be looking to bet or that I really want to bet. But if I'm including him in a full-type PRP situation, or if it's a pick show, you need to go with one guy or the other. Someone hits you up and says, you know, who's your lean, Clint? Who's your lean, Cody? Yeah, I think Budka's wrestling and his grappling is the is the stylistical, you know, it favors him, right? He should win. But do I love it? Nah, no. Nah. All right. Fair enough, man. Hey, first disagreement of the evening. I'm, I'm leaning dog or pass on this one. Um I just, especially with the short notice nature of it, you know what I mean? I, I'd be worried Dylan couldn't keep that up for a hard 15 minutes against this guy who we saw with good enough hips to sprawl. And just this late trend, man, of the perceived damage over the control. Like, if you're not doing damage, these judges are like, get out of here. So I, I'm going to, I'd go with the kickboxer. <laughs> but uh, not a not a, a fight I have any confidence to go to the, the bank with here on yet. <laughs> Next up, we've got Gene Matsumoto, and he's taking on Dan Arrueta. Dan the Determined, who is coming off of back-to-back -back no contests. And, Cody, this just feels like the UFC is selling on this kid. He's 9-1, and one, but back-to-back -back no contests where stuff doesn't look great. And they're like, hey, 24-year-old, 14-0, and 0, undefeated, BJJ Black Belt. Like, oh, this is the kid right here. That's the guy. And I ran his tape. 
Kid looks clean, man. I am not the guy that buys in on these Dana White's contender series kid. In fact, I try to fade every single one of them, but every once in a while, man, you get you get a Peyton Talbot. Every once in a while, there's that little gem where you're like, okay, that kid's good. That's the vibe I'm getting from this Gene Matsumoto kid. Now, Dan arweta has got the wrestling. He's got the pace. He's just kind of relentless, constantly staying in front of you. He's got decent submissions when he gets on top of people. But I'm like, damn, is he going to break Gene with cardio? I don't think so. Is he going to sub this black belt kid? Nah, I don't think he's going to do that either. So if we're striking, oh, Gene's winning that too. Man, I, I like Gene in this spot, and it's rare that I'll take a favorite debuting Dana White's contenders fighter. But I think I'm going to find a way to play this kid. I, I like everything I see. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to agree. He looks like a legitimate prospect. And like you said, he's a BJJ black belt on the ground. He's got a nasty submission game, but he's a very clean technical striker. Uh, continuously getting better, making improvements all around. And one of these guys that comes from the Dana White's contender series. But as you mentioned, it's a system that's taking the best up-and-comers and pitting them up with perceived best up-and-comers from every other region. So there's going to be these gems come through. A guy like Jamal Hill comes from Contender Series, wins yeah. a UFC title. A guy like Peyton Talbot, as you mentioned, you know, young in his career, comes through the Contender Series, you know, could be a future world champion. John Matsumoto is 24 years old. You know, he's 14-0. and 0. He's already got experience. He's already got a very well-rounded skill set. Young, good-looking, in-shape kid, and 24 years old. So extremely problematic. And yeah, probably somebody that you're going to be betting many times in the future because... He factors in the division quite well. Dan Argueta is a bit of a wild card, man, because like I think he can win this fight, but he's so like inconsistent. You watch him at his best and at his worst, and his two way different guys, and it's like yeah. a massive trend here on the Contender Series against Ricky uh, Tercios. He's off. He's this is no good. He's he's largely out of place. Goes back to the Contender Series or to the regional scene, wins a couple fights. He beats Diego Silva for the LFA bantamweight title. Right, bantamweight, one thirty five. Fights for the title, takes a split decision. Hard fight fought, a uh, hard fought fight, and then takes a UFC debut against Damon Jackson effectively one month later. Went five rounds at 135 pounds, makes his debut four weeks later up a weight class against Damon Jackson on short notice. Damn near beat da Damon Jackson, who we'll talk about later. Would have been a quality victory. Damn near beat yeah. him on short notice up a weight class. The guy's a solid power wrestler who is grindy, good grappling, you know. Guy's going to upset a lot of people. And if you can get him a plus money, I can see past the victory for him. Literally, very next fight against Nick Aguar doesn't look great, but gets the win. Next fight against Ronnie Lawrence looks career best, dominating Ronnie Lawrence. Multiple takedowns, sets up shop, nasty guillotine choke. Ref thinks that Ronnie Lawrence is out. He stops it. That's why it's a no contest. Can you fault Dan Argueta? No, he did everything right. Yeah. He was dominating that fight. Look quality. And then quite literally, the very next fight against Miles John, he looked good for the first round and then just gassed. Now, why didn't he gas in that five-round LFA fight down a weight class when he's cutting all that weight? Why didn't he gas on short notice against Damon Jackson taking on a 10-fight UFC veteran on less than a month's notice coming off? Like, like, why didn't he gas in that spot? Why didn't, why wasn't he, I guess Ronnie Lawrence was done within like two and a half minutes, but he did his best. That power wrestling game, he can continuously do it for two or three rounds and he can win rounds and he can win fights. And the one angle that he has on John Masamoto is he is a better wrestler than him and he figures to probably score takedowns. Masamoto does have a slick BJJ game. He does have nasty submissions. But if Argueta is continuously taking him down, holding him down, setting up shop, again, you're, you're leaving it subjective. One guy's racking up top control time. The other guy's fishing for submissions off his back. It's not necessarily the best look. It's that you can't trust Argueta because sometimes he's that guy and sometimes he's curling over after a round and, and, and losing. And so Miles John ended up testing positive for steroids. And then John just won against Cody Gibson a couple weeks ago as well. So not a bad loss. None of these are bad losses. Back-to-back -back no contest could have been back-to-back -back wins in a different world. Yep. But that's the fight game. It's very unforgiving. So as much as I think Massimoto is the real deal and I like him and, you know, you're, we're going to have some, some fractions or some shares of him this weekend, some people higher than others, but I can't can just write off Argueta quite yet. The fact that it's a 30-year-old versus a 24-year-old, to me, does favor Argueta, kind of a full-grown man entering the prime of his career, whereas Matsumoto is a mean some bitch and a nasty prospect, but 24 years old, right? There's still some room for error there. He's undefeated at 14 and 0. There's room for error there. A guy like Argueta, you can't look back on tape and say he's fought a whole lot of guys like this with a with an American grind and American wrestling style to them. So in many ways, this is kind of where these guys struggle in their first spot. But when you watch the tape on him, like you said, he's clean. So I guess I, I am going to go with Matsumoto, but uh, 
like I, I actually don't <laughs> mind Dan Argueta. He's not a bad fighter. It's just he's yeah. so inconsistent with what version of him's going to show up that I can't trust him. Uh, yeah, I bet him in his last fight, man. The the Miles John spot, I was so convinced. I was absolutely convinced that his pace would break Miles John's. And then, poof, oh, drug test is like, oh, man, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you never get your so, money um, back on those. So no. uh, if you know a guy's on steroids, bet him 100%. Ab- absolutely. My my opinion has shifted because back, back in the day, Cody, I was the good guy. Nobody on steroids. You're a cheat. I'm going to stay. Now I'm like, if I know he's on steroids, I'm betting the shit out of him. Like, give me, <laughs> give me my cash. You can pop and, and get it turned to a no contest later, but give me the money. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Yeah, yeah. This Walter <laughs> Valker guy, Oh, buddy, sign me oh, off. Oh, <laughs> sign me up. Get the vault. <laughs> uh, there's actually a couple tonight. I've got my eye on one later on. Next up, we have got Cynthia Calvillo taking on Piera Rodriguez. And, uh, I, man, okay, so, Cody, I have always – I used the example the last time I broke down a Cynthia Calvillo fight. Uh, my betting mentor, my gambling mentor, Jimmy the Bag from over on Pub Sports Radio, uh, he taught me – Taught me how to bet hockey, and he always used this uh, this example that he's like, man, especially when it comes to like playoff hockey, you want to not give your opponent the chance to think they're in it, right? You want to give not give them the opportunity to get that second wind. It's like if you're up two and zero in a series, you don't let them make it two one. You step on their necks. You absolutely kill them, crush their you know crush their emotion, crush their vibe. Take them out of it when you have the opportunity. And he applies that with his betting, that he's like, I know teams are going to do that, so when you find someone you're hot with, you ride it. Or if you find someone you can fade, you ride it. And that's been Cynthia Calvillo for me. We're stepping on her neck. We've done it the last four fights in a row. Like, the girl is on an awful, awful skid. She's hopping weight classes. She's trying to find new life. She can't figure out if she's a boxer, if she's a wrestler. She's 36 years old. Her last two fights have been splits. So like it's close. They're bringing her back around again. And I get it. I get it. She's going to be slightly bigger. She's going to be slightly longer. She's probably the better striker, but we've seen those cracks, man. We've seen where she can't quite keep the pace. She can't quite make the weight. She's not reacting well to the punches anymore. Like it's it's just kind of all starting to add up to a fighter that's about out of here. Um, Peter Rodriguez, nine and one, just got her O taken by my girl, Jillian Robertson, in uh, what was actually a pretty good fight, man. She got the grappling going early and actually took Jillian down, and then the size became a problem. Jillian, you know, reversed her, got on top, and she's tough as nails, though, man. She is mean. If you remember, she didn't tap. She was pissed at the ref for stopping the fight when her arm was about to snap in half they rescued this girl and she was like no no i did not tap like she wasn't even she wasn't even protesting the loss she just didn't want anybody to think that she tapped to an arm bar she's got big power she's got decent offensive wrestling the one issue i have with her though is all that muscle man she hasn't learned how to pace herself yet she almost got my girl sam hughes almost came back on her in round three sam was starting to work her magic but it was too little too late she had already racked up those first two rounds uh, i kind of like Pera rodriguez in this spot my initial lean i'll be honest with you guys was cynthia that i'm like she's bigger she's more technical she can probably out wrestle rodriguez the way jillian did but then i kind of pumped the brakes and i'm like you know what i'm gonna flip every single narrative that I just gave you. And I'm, I'm going to take the younger fighter. I'm going to take the prime fighter. I'm going to take the fighter that hits harder. And like, I- I'm just going to hope she's able to do enough damage in those spots where Cynthia kind of wavers. And-, and I'm worried about, you know, the mental state of Cynthia. I couldn't bear to put my money on somebody where I'm just like, dude, she could, she could just be done halfway through first round. You know what I mean? If she's getting close to retirement, if she's on this awful streak and this girl pops her in the mouth hard one time and dumps her on her ass. She could just be like, you know what? <laughs> Maybe I'm done. So I'm I'm worried Calvillo's uh, ready for that R word. And I'm going to go ahead and take Pierre Rodriguez here, man. What do you make of this one? Yeah, yeah, I agree with a lot of your points, but it's a dogger pass spot to me. So I'm actually going to go Calvillo, take a little bit of plus money here. Yeah, women's MMA, you expect it to be pretty close and competitive. And with Cynthia Calvillo, it's so easy to be like, five fight losing streak. Look at the five fight losing streak. So Caitlin Chukagian is a former title challenger. She went the distance with her. Fairly competitive fight. Jessica Andrade, former world champion. Andrea Lee, that one was the outlier. But it's not like Lee's a bad talent. That she was got before the fall. She got seriously fucked up in that fight, though. So like, uh, 
going on, uh, Nina Nunez. Okay, the Nina Nunez fight is super interesting. She loses a split to what is regarded as a pretty good fighter. In that split, she lands three takedowns and she outstrikes Nina Nunez 48 to 39. So you take your opponent down, you land the control time, you outstrike her, you land the better shots, so to speak. You lose a contentious split decision over, again, which is otherwise considered a top-level fighter. Then she gets Lupita Godinez, who's a pretty good fighter. And again, she got the lone takedown in the fight and outstruck her 104 to 87. And that's her strawweight debut. This is a girl that struggled to make 125 in the past. If you check the, and because topology once in a while, it's a cool little stat that they'll do. But you check this Nina Nunez fight, right? She makes 125.5. And then night of the fight, they reweighed her and she's 136.4. There's a gain of 10.9 pounds, right? 9% weight gain since weigh-in. So at, at, at her biggest, she's walking into the cage at 135 pounds. The fact that she can make 115 is astounding. The one fight that she has down there goes back down there against Lupita Godinez, considered a, a higher-end fighter of the division. She fights a very competitive decision where it's a split. She outstrikes her by nearly 20 significant strikes and scores a lone takedown. All good stuff. Now, yeah, year-long layoff, 36 years old, a little banged up. Where's her confidence at? Those are all fair points. But if you look at Pierre Rodriguez, what, what do you think Pierre Rodriguez does against Caitlin Chikagian, Jessica Andrade, uh, Nina Nunez, Lupita Godinez, Jessica I back in that day for that matter, you know, fights with Carlos Sparza and Joanne Wood. I think Pierre Rodriguez is winning those. No, she'd be also on a five-fight fucking losing streak, right? Calvillo <laughs> fights the best of the best former world title challengers and top five competition and largely doesn't give a bad of account of herself. Back at 115, you mentioned last time about Pierre Rodriguez. Oh, she started off well against Jillian Robertson, but but then the size took over. Well, then she's fighting Cynthia Calvillo, right? Who's giant, especially at 115, giant. Watch weigh-ins. Probably doesn't even make 115. This That's fight's fair. probably going to be a catchweight at 120. Um, again, if you're giving me plus money for Calvillo, what I have now is I've got the experience advantage for sure. We've already We've already established all that. Pierre Rodriguez, offensively as a wrestler, she muscles a lot of her technique because she's very physically strong, but she grabs you in that body lock when she tries to pin you up against the cage. It's largely tugging you to the ground. I would say Calvillo, someone who spent a lot, long time at Team Alpha Male, comes from a wrestling background, um, moved over to a few different gyms since then, but all the same, she is the better wrestler. Pierre Rodriguez, that's offensive wrestling. Defensive wrestling, Pierre Rodriguez, not all that good. She doesn't have much of a get-up game, Clint. Like, it's it's not that good. If you yeah. go back and you watch the Jillian Robertson fight, she gets her lone takedown and gets 56 seconds. 56 seconds of control time before Robertson pops back up. Robertson proceeds to take her down two on, I think it's twice on four attempts, and racks up like six and a half minutes of top control. She can't get back up. She can't stuff the takedown, and she can't get back up. And the more she allows the bigger fighter to lie on top of her, she just flat gasses and gives up a submission. Now, I know, I know. It's your girl, Jillian Robertson, and Jillian Robertson known to finish people. These are the people that Jillian Robertson finishes. Pollyanna Viana, uh, Mariana Agapova, Priscilla Cachoeira. Yeah, those people she finishes. Those people she finishes. Pierre might be in that category with those people. At least her defensive grappling. Okay, well, let's say grappling's off the table. Let's say it's a striking battle. Would you say that Pierre Rodriguez is a better striker than Cynthia Calvillo? No. No. She might be loading up some shots, but she's lower volume. And again, she's a little bit stiff and mechanical. She's trying to hit you with a big power shot. She's not setting it up. She's not setting traps. She's not using her footwork. She's not boxing in combinations. And she doesn't have an educated jab. Calvillo, again, when she was at Alpha Male, she was one of the striking coaches. She would teach people striking. She's a solid striker. When she's fighting fucking Lupita Godinez, who, by the way, she outstruck like 102 to 88. Did I mention that? When she's fighting yeah. those girls, she can still strike with them. This is a, this is a quality striker. She's got a volume advantage. She's got a technical boxing advantage. She's got a slight speed advantage. She's fought in 15 minutes multiple times in her career, so you would think she has a cardio advantage. As you mentioned, the Sam Hughes fight, that's Rodriguez's best fight. And by the numbers, she at least landed 80 significant strikes in that fight. Numerically, it's her best fight. And quality of win, it's probably her best fight. So you go back to that one, and it's like she's a front runner, has a good first two rounds, and gasses. And then the Jillian Robertson fight, she has a good first round, half of a first round, gases. So Calvillo's proven, experienced, fought in way better girls, better skill set. 
And it's again, it's not like oh, 36 Calvillo is getting tossed in there against some hot up and coming prospect from Russia or Brazil or, you know, just some Kazakhstan with tons of this and that. It's like she's getting a 31 year old Perry Rodriguez who's got 10 pro fights and to be honest with you, is short on quality victories. So again, this is all just coming back down to a dogger pass. Like, I wouldn't want to bet Rodriguez as a favorite over Calvillo. That's not going to happen. So I might as well take some of that plus money on Cynthia and say, yeah, five fight losing streak looks bad on paper, but we've seen guys like Carlos Condit snap a long ass losing streak. They just got to give you the right matchup. Court McGee, again, another guy we'll talk about in a little bit, but like there's a winnable fight for anybody on the roster. You just need the matchmakers to give you that fight. So hopefully that's the one for Calvillo. Damn it, Cody. Are you going to talk me into betting Cynthia Calvillo this week? Plus money. Was, oh. I mean, come on. Come on. We need a few dogs here. You got a dog on the card already. I, I don't think I had one to this point. Yeah, she's plus 140, man. Oh, my God. I got to watch her make weight, Cody. I got to watch her make weight. I'm going to pump the yeah. brakes. We'll see on Friday what she looks like on the scales. If she looks like good, motivated, makes the weight, you know, if she if she pulls a Chidi and Jaquani on me and she's good to go for this fight, then, you know, maybe I'll go ahead and uh, pile in the clown car here for uh, Cynthia. It's hard Calvillo to say. Week. It's hard to say. I've always said with Wayne's, like I always watch Wayne's and I largely wet, uh, wait to lock in some of these bets based on Wayne's, but Wayne's don't tell you shit. Because how many times have you seen the Wayne's and it's like, oh man, they're dragging that body off of the scale. And then the next day, they're good to go. And Mano Fioro, I better, one of the few good picks I had last week. Uh, she looked so bad on the scale. She looked man. terrible. Oh, I was like, oh shit. It's a five round fight. This young, young, I'm not going to compare to Yatsumoto, but when you're young, 24 years old, and you're the future of the game, it's like, yeah, no problem. That happened to everybody. At, at one point, all of these guys were that next big thing, and then they usually lose, go back to the drawing board, and then they come back. You know, you got to lose to get better. So sometimes you're fading a prospect based on that. But in this case, it's like Pierre Rodriguez is just not, she's not it as far as I'm yeah. concerned. No, I hear you. I'm I'm with you there. All right. Next up, we've got Alatang Haley taking on Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo with you can't see it in this shot, but one of the coldest topology pictures ever. You can see his opponent like absolutely like still trying to come to in the background. I'm like, that's messed up, man. Make <laughs> you make that one your profile picture for for the it world. Almost, it almost see. looks photoshopped just because it's like, where, <laughs> it where's the ref? Where's the ref that this guy's been able to pose in front of the camera while his <laughs> right. opponent tries to his soul is leaving his body. You can actually see the soul. Do you He's see like that? Coming He's leaving through, his man. motherfucking body, right? And uh, who goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll admit, that is a cold-ass picture. It's cold at that point. It's like looking up slam dunk in the dictionary, and you see the guy getting dunked on. Like, that's what this is. Uh, Al Tang Haile, he's out of uh, Fight Ready, the Mongolian Knight, my, my favorite gym, my favorite camp. 32 years old. Hey, I love that gym, man. But I think Alatang Haley is one of these guys that's kind of proven himself to be pretty mid at the end of the day. He's got wins over guys like uh, Kevin Kroom, Ryan Benoit, split decision, no less. And then you give him that step up in competition. He's losing pretty cleanly to guys like Chris Gutierrez, Casey Caney. Like he's big. He's strong. He's decent everywhere. They rave about how good of a wrestler he is. He just never uses it. Like, he does not go out there and grind on people the way you want to see for a guy that's got all these wrestling accolades. And he gets outstruck by a lot of these guys who just have that higher volume and that cleaner, crisper striking. But when he does get a step down in competition, seems to do pretty damn well. Victor Hugo... He's another Dana White's contender series, guys. Uh, he's 31 years old. He's making his debut, and he's been on an absolute tear of just taking people out early, man. Round one, round two, round one, round one, round two. Like, this guy's a finisher. He's got a bunch of decisions on his record, too. I think seven. Uh, but he's got, like, eight wins by knockout, nine wins by sub. So more often than not, he's taking people out of there. Um, the thing is, I actually bet against Victor Hugo on the episode of Dana White's Contender Series that he was on. And my whole my whole thing behind that was, I don't trust this guy's cardio. Like, he can extend these lower-level guys and squeeze his way to a decision, but I don't think he'll be able to do that against quality competition. Sure enough, round two comes around, and he looks tired, Cody. He's getting worn out. And what happens? They fall on a knee bar. He just gets the perfect position to roll, snatch the dude's hip and put it up by his ear. Like that was a brutal finish for me to watch because it looked to me like he was starting to fade and Eduardo was maybe starting to take over that fight. 
uh, lost the ticket for me there. But this is the kind of spot more that I was talking about before. This is the kind of spot that I look for where I'm like, hey, this guy I'm not so sold on coming off Dana White's contender series, leaping straight into the UFC against a guy with a bunch of hours, a bunch of miles at a high level, and you're favoring him over the UFC guy? No, man. I, I think I like Haley Alatang in this spot. Now, he always fights close with his opponents, so it's always a bit of a sketchy prospect to take this guy, but he's plus money. Plus 105, minus 125. We're getting barely better than a pick em, but I, I'll take it, man. I think I like Haley Alatang in this spot just because we can rely on him to weather that early storm and then kind of hang out in the fight. He probably needs to win rounds two and three, but I think he can do that. Yeah, I completely agree with you, actually. I think who goes one of these guys with just like a super ballooned up record. Now, his record actually looks decent on paper as opposed to these guys. Largely, when you hear 24 and 4, it's your UFC debut, and you're 31 years old, you're just not fighting anybody. That's 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 yeah. that's it, right? How do you build up that type of record? But in his case, it's like he does selectively pick guys with good records. 6 and 0, 19 and 3, 5 and 1. Three and one, 17 and eight, 23 and nine, 15 and seven, 16 and one. Those are all good records, man. He no. himself is just not that good. And the interesting thing I'm not here, saying he's a fraud. Uh, sometimes saying, I call them outright yeah. frauds. He's not a fraud. <laughs> he's, he's not a fraud. It, it's just there's certain things about him that I just don't love. You know, he's got the 24 yeah. wins and 17 of them are way by, are, uh, by way of finish. And yet his nickname is Striker. Okay. Striker. Keep this in mind. Of his 24 wins, only seven wins by knockout, 10 by submission, more of a or a grappler, if anything. You look at his quality wings, they're mostly by knee bar, for the record. A move that could, in theory, work in the UFC. Of course it could work in the UFC. It's a submission. But you're probably going to get your head punched in if you try doing that shit in the UFC. It works on the regional scene. Again, I'm not saying leg locks don't work. You watch jiu-jitsu tournaments, it's all leg locks. In a fight, especially something not Bellator or LFA or, you know, Fury FC, like once you get to the higher level, you don't want to be rolling on legs as like a primary primary weapon of getting the job done. Like you got to rely on other things. His name's Striker, and yet shows more submission wins, seems more comfortable as a grappler. And when you watch him strike, Clint, he's not good. The guy's not actually a good striker. I don't know where he got the nickname from. So on the contender series, again, fight goes to the second round. He's gassed. He had landed nine significant strikes through about seven minutes of fighting. Nine significant strikes. But he's a striker. Strike. No, man. Don't quite see it. I don't quite see it. Now, the thing with I highly Tang is yes, yes. And you touched upon this. Uh fights pretty, pretty competitive fights. Kind of fights to his opponent's level. Thing is, is that yeah, he's fairly cast iron. Dude hasn't been finished in nine years, hasn't been submitted in nine years. I think it was 2015. He got caught in an arm bar against some mean Kazakh dude back when he was just a Chinese fighter with a losing record. Since then, he's moved to the United States. He's gone to fight ready. He's gotten a lot better. You look at his losses, Casey Kinney, uh, Chris Gutierrez. Bo both those guys are factors within the, the top 15. What the Casey Kinney? I don't know, man. There's a lot of guys I think about, like, this guy's super talented and yet just doesn't fight. But as you know, because you train a little bit and you're kind of in the scene beyond just, like, the whole social media and picks and previews and stuff like that. Like, these guys just get banged up, dude. I see it all yeah. the time. My guy was TJ Laramie. This guy's going to be the next big thing. Crushes everybody in Canada. Signs to the UFC a little early. Off the Contender Series. Too soon. They gave him some bad fights. He fought Melsic Bagdasarian and uh, Pat Sabatini. <laughs> what? And then they cut him. Like, we yeah. got putzes that get to fight out their entire four-fight deal. And this... Mid-20, hot phenom prospect that got two bad fights is cut. Doesn't make no sense. And he just shreds his shoulder. And then because Canada's free health care, so awesome, you have to wait so fucking Candy long to get anything done. <laughs> Not that awesome. And so, like, he just, you know, he's been waiting, like, six months to get his shoulder done. Now he's quietly lost a year and a half of his career. Like, it's such a small window to be a competitive athlete, let alone a prize fighter. That okay. you're bought, yeah, and, and and I've always said this because from all the gyms I've been in, it's not the most talented guy in the room. That's not the guy that makes it. It's the guy that's like the most dedicated and cast iron. He's a little bit slower. He's a little bit not as athletic, but like he thoroughly enjoys it. He doesn't have family and friends that he feels the need to go to birthday parties to or, uh, you know, weddings to. And just this, you have to be singularly gold in one thing have to be a selfish person i'm just gonna do this i'm just gonna get better so to me highly allotting moving from china down in north america going to fight ready like that he improves his career and i've not been finished guy like hot prospect like casey kinney body just couldn't take it my boy ronnie lawrence he's 27 retired body just can't take it no more so it's a it's a tough go 
when I see him take the split over Ryan Benoit, or sorry, the fight with Dana Baccarel, geez, it's pretty back and forth decision. His fight with Ryan Benoit, who, you know, at his best has got to win over Sergio Pettis, at his worst, not all that good. Still, decision. Casey Kinney, decision. He got beat up pretty good in that fight. Still, never faulted, never went over. Gustavo Lopez, not terrible. Kevin Kroom, he knocked Kevin Kroom out in 47 seconds. Anybody watch Kevin Kroom and Bare Knuckle Boxing? Dude can fight. And dude can take one hell of a punch, too. Like, holy shit. And he can steal your girl, too. So watch that. But main thing <laughs> is, is like, knocks him out. The win over Chad Ellinger, another fellow grinder, a fight that goes a hard 15. The win over Chad didn't age all that terrible. Chad coming off a win of his own a couple weeks back. And then again, goes another decision with Gutierrez. So to finish Haile Eilatang at this point, fair to say, you're going to have to hit him in the head with a fucking frying pan, man. Like submitting him is <laughs> going to be difficult. No one's done it in yeah. nine years. Knocking him out is going to be difficult. He's fun. <laughs> way better guys than Victor Hugo. And now he's got a spot in, in Hugo where Hugo doesn't quite have the gas to go the hard 15 with Alatang. And alatang has got 15 minutes of gas for anybody in the division. And that's a lie. He's got gas for anybody in the top fringe 15, you know, just that's out of that top 10 in the division. He's tough. Tougher than Hugo. And so Hugo might come out, start early, you know, use a little bit of that speed advantage. Let that, that plodding fighter kind of, you know, stand in front of you a little bit. But the longer the fight goes, Alatang starts to land. He starts to connect. I think he can take Hugo down. I don't see him getting submitted. I think he's got the better durability. He's got the better gas tank. Hugo's got four pro losses. Two of them are by knockout. I don't honestly think he's all that durable, truth be told. So Alatang's yeah. on the table for a late stoppage or Especially just win two of the three rounds. Yeah, 100%. And it's the apex. It's a small little uh, venue. You're going to have to fight him. There's no avoiding him. There's no, I'm tired, let me take a breather. Like, he fights a decent style. And then, as you mentioned, you're an Arizona boy, but Fight Ready is legitimately one of the best camps in the world. So, uh, all, all good stuff. Again, we got a guy with more experience, a solid skill set, better durability, better cardio, and he's slight underdog. Yeah, it just makes all the sense in the world. So, we were on the same page there. Hell yeah. Glad to hear that, man, because that's going to be my link memorial dog of the week. Uh, Cody, I don't know if you saw the post, my boy. We unfortunately lost Link over the holidays this past year, and we thought what better way to keep his memory close to us than to make a dog of the week every single show. I'm picking one underdog per week and hoping over the course of the year we end up profitable. So far, we have achieved that. Unfortunately, I flipped last week from it being Buckley to it being Dumas. I'm the dumbass. Uh, so we're officially five and six on the year, hoping to make it six and six this week. But since they're all dogs, we are profitable at the moment with the Link Memorial Dog of the Week. And Alatang is going to be the, the call this week here. Um, taking the coward's way out, going for a small dog. But hey, coming off missing on a big dog last week. We got to do what we got to do, right? <laughs> all right, everybody. Next up, we've got Norma Dumont. She takes on, or welcomes back rather, the Iron Lady, Jermaine Durandamy. Now, Cody, I know a lot of people can't stand women's MMA. I know a lot of people would prefer really? to rush on by it. And yeah, man. When you say a lot of people, give me a percent. Give me a percent of MMA fans. Not hardcores. Hardcores are hardcore. But like, what do you think the percentage of MMA fans who like don't don't like it? I heard a lot of people in Atlantic City walked out. Okay, that wasn't it was they don't love women's MMA. It wasn't the best fight, right? Yeah, it was not a good fight. Do you think they'd walk out on, like, top quality? This fight's going to be an absolute bang. Why don't people like women's MMA? Explain it to me. I'd just love to hear I your just, perspective on this. I think it just gets a bad rap, man. I mean, all the way dating back from when Dana was like, oh, women never be in the UFC. Like, it just always had, like, this shadow hanging over it. And right. then you've got debacles like Carla and Rose, Nami Yunus 2, that, like, <laughs> you've got – and <laughs> so many Holly Holm main events. Holly Holm does one thing, man, and that's pin you against the fence for 25 minutes. That, like, I think it's just got they forget about the good fights that we've had for women's MMA. They forget about the the Wiley Zhang versus JJ's. They forget, you know what I mean? Like, they don't remember those ones because the only ones that are highlighted are the bad ones all the freaking time. And every time we talk women's MMA, if it takes more than like three, four minutes, people in the chat are like, next fight, move on. And it's like, right, ah. right. anyway, I'll tell you something, so dude. You know how I got into watching fights like like predominantly is like 2006. YouTube's starting to just start kicking it. You need to watch Kimbo Slice beat some guy's ass oh, yeah. in an alley, right? Because it was free on YouTube. You can watch like UFC stuff on YouTube. It was like fringe. Someone recording, you know, their TV or something like that. But anyways, you just watch street fights. Then from street fights, you end up watching. You ever watch felony fights? Like, did you remember that? No. Bully <laughs> beatdown was my thing. Yeah, but well, Bully Beatdown was a good time. Potentially fixed and written. My boy Thomas Denny says, 
it work, work. But he's the guy that didn't get no knockdowns, no submissions. The bully got 10 grand. So Thomas was made to look like an idiot. So I could see why he'd be like, it was a work. When I watched that fight back, he beat the shit out of the bully. The guy just didn't go down. I don't yeah. know what you want me to tell you. Thought it actually yeah. a decent game plan. Bully beat down, you know, backyard Good fights, time. felony fights, bum fights. Uh, you know, you watched whatever you could. Then IFL launched. It was like free on TV. That was about 2006. And then Ultimate Fighter launches, and then it's on Spike, and then it becomes something that's free on TV, so you watch it. My bottom line is I would watch anything. Yep. Two people want to throw hands, I'm in. Doesn't matter if it's at the <laughs> grocery store. Doesn't matter where it's at. One time, me and my buddy Corey Erdman, and he's a boxing analyst, well-known, works for DAZN, traveled the entire globe, been to pretty well every country to call boxing at the highest level, World Championship fights. Erdman's the man. We're getting like burritos. It's like 2.30 in the morning. We're downtown Toronto. And oh, there's like a nightclub just down from where we're grabbing this burrito. And fight breaks out on the street. Guy like runs out. They have some words. They throw some fight, some fists. And then he uh, just takes off running. Then this Escalade rolls up right in the middle of the road. Right in the middle of the road. And this dude who was just arguing with this guy comes out of the Escalade. He's like, he's like you're fucked now. And they start just fighting in the middle of the road while this Escalade just idles in the road. So I'm like, dude, Erdman, we got a burrito. We're getting dinner. <laughs> we're getting dinner and a show. It's like 2.30 in the morning. It's not really dinner. <laughs> we're getting a late night snack and a show. Like, we got to go. And I remember as I get up, he, like, puts his hand on my shoulder and, like, goes to tug me back down. And I was just like, what are you, what are you doing, man? Like, these guys are throwing. He's like, it's not worth getting hit by a stray bullet on some stupid street fight. And it made a lot of sense. It made a lot of sense. It's like this guy's in an Escalade at 2.30 in the morning, parked on the road. They're come out of a nightclub. They're fighting. We're in the middle of downtown Toronto. It's a good point one of these guys pulls a gun. There's a good point if the guy pulls a gun, he's going to pull the trigger. There's a really good chance that if he pulls the gun and pulls the trigger, he's got no shit for accuracy. And that bullet's just literally heading in any which way direction. So Erdman makes a good point. Like, just sit. Why would you yeah. risk your life for it? But then in my mind, in the moment, it was like, if I died getting hit by we a stray fight. bullet, watching a <laughs> Deese fight on a Friday night with a burrito in my hand, it would be an okay. It would be an honorable death. I'd get a sick place to go, baby. It's an honorable, <laughs> it's an honorable death. It's honorable death. My dog got lied. With. You, you say you said your dog Link. Man, my dog Sophie had 18 years. This dog uh, lived miniature dashing. My absolute best friend. And then we lost her one time. I was so upset. And then my dad's like, you know, what are you upset about? I was like, there's bears out there. Does dog get killed by a bear? And he goes, if that dog got killed by a bear, it'd be an honorable death. And I was like, that's a good point. You know, yep. it is. Yep. It is. You know, there's worse, there's worse ways to die. Yeah. People say there's better ways to die. But do you want to die in your deathbed? I haven't experienced anything. Or did you want to die? I was like, I fought a bear hand to hand. Lost. <laughs> but I got some licks in. Still feel I won the fight. <laughs> so... Yep. To jump, to jump back to wherever we are right here. I like it. Jermaine Duran, me 40 years old. Love having her back. Good times. And yeah, yes, man. I will watch women's MMA. I'll watch absolutely anything. Yeah, man. Now, every, I don't know how to circle back from that. There are like four different topics in that tangent. <laughs> <laughs> Norva Dumont, world famous for the dump truck. That's, that's her main fan base coming in here. Man, she's on a three-fight win streak. She's strong. Like I know we make jokes about her being thick, you know, but she is she is strong and she hits hard. She's got some of the best memes in the UFC where she sent, you know, Chelsea Chandler sprinting to the other side of the cage after connecting well. But bro, I've got a problem with her fight IQ. Like she just never seems to put herself in the optimal position to win. Um she should have freaking finished what was her biscuit that she fought back Danielle in the day. Wolf? Yeah, man. Mm. I I put I had so much money on Dumont inside the distance. It's like the one and only time I've ever very seriously bet Norma Dumont. And the fact that she just sat on her chest for 15 minutes pissed me off to no end. Jermaine Durand to me also has some hatred because she was the worst champion in UFC history, refused to fight Cyborg over the PEDs thing, blah, blah, blah. Now she's gone for four years. That's her big thing, man. She's been so inactive. And she just had a kid. And I, Cody, my whole thing is the new mom fade. If you're coming back for your first fight after becoming a new mother, I can't put my money on you. But just because of the being a dad, right? Like I saw what my wife went through. I can't imagine her doing that. And then in nine months, turning around and being in shape to fight somebody. Like not to mention the physical and mental transition that you go through from being a cage fighter to being a mother. Like now you've got to be this loving, caring thing and you got to protect this little thing. And sometimes they seem to lose that edge. Sometimes they seem to lose that killer instinct. If they don't lose it, 
Sometimes it takes a little while for it to come back. So that first fight back, I refuse to bet on people who are coming off of becoming a first-time mother. So Jermaine Duran to me just has a kid, four-year-long layoff. If this fight was two years ago, I am hammering Jermaine Duran to me in this spot, man. World-class kickboxer. Absolutely massive for the weight class. It's like Holly Holm. These women that are like on the pinnacle of the sport, they just hang around. Like the rest of women's MMA has never caught up to them. I would back Jermaine Durand to me against almost anybody, but the four-year layoff and the new kid scared the ever-living piss out of me. Uh, I'm watching this one closely also for the scale because the women's 145-pound division doesn't exist in the UFC anymore. Norma Dumont can't make 135. We know that for a fact she's missing weight on Friday. So I'm going to be watching this thing closely. That's the one thing I think that might be able to tip me over on the Jermaine side, is if Jermaine comes back and she's got abs popping out, and she looks like a monster, and she makes weight cleanly, and then Dumont looks like death on the scale, and she can't quite get down to 135. You know, those two things combined, I might pull the trigger on Jermaine Durand to me. I think it's dog or pass just because of that ceiling but Jermaine at 39 years old off this layoff I, I don't know if I can do it man yeah yeah fair I can see all your points again I'm, they're all fair you got a 39 year old Jermaine to Randomy coming off a long layoff but yeah this is another dogger pass situation Randy me at plus 165 yeah. like okay I'm, I, I'm in on that <laughs> um okay so we'll go back to the kid comment because it's valid uh my my wife actually just had her second kid on Friday brought the baby back today on, so. congrats man I know, I know and where is it's like damn you just went through that I can't imagine you get back in the gym and getting in a prize fight a short term later the amount of strength you never realize this until they have the kid it's like the amount of you know you have to push you're in labor for an hour and a half two hours they give everything they got they're like done and then the doctor's like get at it again second contraction coming around again and they just yep. get back at if this is a ufc fight how many verbal submissions are in there where it's like ah and it's like well this fight's done you know you, you can't you can't Dude, squeal my wife was cracking jokes that. Like the doctor was like, what is wrong with you? Cause she was like making jokes in the middle of that shit. She strongest person on the planet. I'll never doubt women. <laughs> I, I, I realized then it's like, that's a whole other level of power. Like I get man, man colds and I'm just like, I'm not going to make it. Let me be. <laughs> Tell my first <laughs> daughter. I'm going to be my lanky. <laughs> yeah. I'm just done. Come on, mom. <laughs> get the big vapor rub. <laughs> I get the black lung. You're just done, right? So I, again, again, to me, Duran, to me, all the all the strengths in the world. She has a kid. She would have been considered. She's 39, 38 when she has the kid. Would have been considered geriatric pregnancy. Like she would be considered older in terms of yeah. having a pregnancy. And then she's gonna drop a weight class on her return after three year long layoff. Like as much as none of this sounds good. This girl's called the Iron Lady for a reason. She's cast iron tough. And if you're going to give me this type of plus 165 money on Jermaine Durand me, just keep in consideration, this is the same Jermaine, Jermaine Durand me. The last time you saw her fight, she choked out Juliana Pena. This is her last fight. Unreal. A win over a former champion, potentially a future champion, and what is largely considered to be the number one contender at 135 pounds. She outstruck her 37 to 27, got up from the takedowns, showed off a new wrinkle to her game that pretty much nobody knew existed. We all know how good of a striker is. If you don't know how good of a striker is, Amanda Nunez took her down eight times because she wanted nothing to do with striking with Jermaine Durand to me. Nothing. She'd get hit twice and be like, nope. Shoot nope. the takedown. And Durand to me still went five rounds with Nunez. Who can, who can claim that? Gave up eight takedowns, still fought through. Elite level striking, adds a new wrinkle to her game, submits Pena. Not only does she submit Pena, but she uses that cardio again. Pena was the one that tires out, allowing Jermaine uh, Durand to me to get the third round submission. So, yeah, it's been three years. Yeah, she's had the kid. Yeah, she's 39. But you're getting what is presumably the number two or three girl in the world. She's a former champion at 145. She's coming down to 135. Got a striking advantage over Norma Dumont. Her wrestling clearly ain't that bad. Dumont doesn't take girls down. She holds them up against the fence. But when you're holding Durandamy, she lands a whole lot of short elbows and short knees. The volume's superior. Her clinch game's pretty solid. Her grappling has clearly come a long way. The three years off it makes you be like, oh, I don't know. But it's entirely possible that she's been improving over that time. It just again, it comes down to plus money, man. This is not, oh, dude, Durandamy's a former champion. She, yeah, she's coming back. It's been a layoff. She's a two to one favorite. Norma Dumont is the favorite. I don't quite get it. And again, when you look at Norma Dumont, her fights in the UFC, 
She gets knocked out by Megan Anderson three minutes and 30 seconds. It's her debut, but against a quality, actually 145 pound fighter, she gets knocked down 330. Ashley Evans Smith, she grinds her for a decision. Felicia Spencer grinds her on a split decision. Aspen Ladd on a five round decision. Macy Chase on she loses, split decision. Daniel Wolf, a one and oh pro boxer, took her to a decision. Carol Rosa, a decision. Chelsea, uh, Chelsea Chandler, her last time out, didn't even have that good of a first round, ends up settling for a decision. All these fights, low volume. All these fights decision. So if you're not gonna if you're not gonna hit Durandamy and hurt her with something, and you're not going to take her down and defensively ground and pound her, maybe pick up a submission, your result is just hold her up against the cage and cling on to her. That that's the move for two to one? Like, no, no way. So I gotta take the back class, I gotta take the iron lady. And uh you make sorry, we'll, we'll move on this point. I know, like you said, people don't love these fights, but yeah, wait for Wayne's maybe because you've got Norma Dumont that uh, back in 2020 against Ashley Evan Smith, she comes in at 139 and a half against Aaron Blanchfield in 2021. Blanchfield declines the fight because Dumont steps on at 139 and a half. Her loss to Macy Chase on's at 145, and she still missed weight coming in at 146 and a half. Still missed weight by half pound up a weight class. So the UFC is torturing both of them, saying you guys could just fight at 145, but the division doesn't exist. So you need to yep. prove that you can be relevant still, and you have to do 135. Well, Durandamy can do that, and she's going to do that. Dumont can't. So it's probably going to be a catch weight. She's probably going to have a bad weight cut. And again, it's, none of this screams two to one. I'm going to bet big Norm, Norma Dumont. So no, no. Dogger pass. I'll take uh, the uh, Iron Lady, Jermaine Durandamy. Damn it, Cody. I've been like, my new mom thing has like kept me off this one, but everything in my being screams that I want to bet Jermaine Durandamy in her comeback fight. You might have got me there, man. I might have to do it. All right, next fight up, we got Court McGee taking on Alex Morono, another fossil coming on back here. I love Court McGee, man. Uh, but he is also, I believe, turning 39 years old. That's the magic number right now is 39. Everybody seems to be 39 right now. Um, <laughs> off a of rough skid, man, last two fights. I mean, Court McGee's whole thing was just how stupid durable he was. His entire career, extremely hard to put away. Ah, he's been knocked out in the first round in his last two fights. It's like, ah, the, the cliff finally came for the man. And now they're throwing him back in there with a volume guy in Alex Morono, who kind of looked like he's put it together a decent bit in the uh, the last couple of fights of his. I know he's like two and two in his last four, but he looked good against Santiago before he died. He messed up Tim Means. He fought a full 15 minutes with Joaquin Buckley. Like the, the big knock I've got on Morono has always been that he's just been so unwilling to like use his grappling and his ground game. I don't think that's the call here, man, because Court McGee is so big and physical. His whole thing is just to, like, pin you up against the fence and grind on you. They call him the crusher, but he should have been the grinder. Like, this guy just absolutely drags people around the cage for 15 minutes. I, I It's worse than the new, new mom paid for me, man. I can't trust Court McGee after back-to-back -back knockout losses, period. And the way... Morono's looked I think the hand speed is just going to be a problem but there is part of me that is like man if, if court can like body lock him Alex Morono's going nowhere like it'll just be a classic court decision 15 minutes of pain type of situation I'm, I'm picking Morono man but I don't have a whole lot of interest in betting this fight what about you yeah, just because the line's a little bit wide then that's what kind of you know throws you off of it but yeah it looked way better a few days ago than it's looking now because money's coming in on Morono and yeah, yeah. I, I, I get it I don't mind taking the dog I don't mind finding the value here and there but Alex Morono is the he is the A side in a fight with Court McGee. Court McGee, legendary durability. As you mentioned, can't knock the guy out. You also cannot submit the guy. Since then, it's like, yeah, that chin's kind of gone a little bit. Not only has he been knocked out twice in his last two fights, back to back knockout losses, but he's actually been knocked down seven times in his UFC career. So you can see he was always the guy that took the damage. And Chuck Liddell, it was a it was a buildup for the chin went. You watch back those old fights, he just walks through these punches like nothing. Then it's gone. Yeah. Of course, the same thing. He was getting dropped, and he could get back up. He got dropped against Sean Brady. He gets back up and loses a decision. He got dropped by Carlos Condit. He gets back up, and he loses a decision. Now he's getting dropped, and that's it. Wells, you know, not even two minutes into the fight. It's like a minute and a half. I think he's 94 seconds in. Knocks him out. Not a particularly good look. Matt Brown, they give you an aged you know, 42-year-old fellow veteran of the game and again you can't make it out of the single round with matt brown it, it doesn't bode well morono's not the biggest power puncher per se but he's got hard 15 minutes of cardio he's a volume puncher for the record he is a brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt he does have a decent ground game so if court just getting a body lock takedown and, and grinding him on the ground isn't on the table if court controlling him up against the cage isn't on the table he's gonna have to strike with him and he's just too goddamn slow to do that takes too many punches 
and he he's too slow to get off his own punches. So you're in a situation where, yeah, this guy's landing three to my one. And back in the day, it worked. But now it's just, it's not going to fly anymore. So when you look at Alex Morono, like he's not looking outclassed in these fights. He actually looks pretty competitive against Joaquin Buckley for the majority of that fight. And Buckley just comes off a career best thrashing over Vincente Luque. So again, Morono's still hanging with some of the better guys of the division. Chokes out Tim Means, quality. The fight with Santiago Ponzinibbio knocked down the third round. He was winning that fight prior to getting knocked out in the third he round. Was. So Morono's got something left to offer. And again, the fact that he can come in and land 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 significant strikes, you know that he can build up. You know that he'll just going to be landing these. Do you remember the boxer Ricardo Mayorga? Nothing straight. Everything just is like choppy and it's like a like a hook over the top. Like it's very, it's very, you know, big, big shot over the top, big shot over the top. Nothing straight and clean. But that type of style is what breaks down a guy like Court McGee, who again is trying to stay linear, is trying to move, but these big shots over the top that he's his, his reflexes aren't quick, quick enough for him to just dart out of the way anymore. He's gonna get hit with something. So as much as he's been known as a durable guy, I think it's on the table for Morono to maybe get the knockout. Again, yeah. though, Morono is more of a decision guy on paper, so you can see it going that route as well. In both scenarios, I just think Morono wins this fight. And it's no knock on McGee, but McGee can still win. It, it has to be over the exact mold of fighter, right? This is a guy, he's two, uh, sorry, he's two and five over his last seven fights. And in his last two, five, seven, he's seven and three in his last 10 fights. Those wins though, okay? Those wins. Alex Garcia, total gas bag, zero cardio, questionable grappling. Claudio Silva is just a, a black belt in BJJ. That's it. He's got terrible cardio. He's got zero striking. He's got zero wrestling. But as I mentioned, Court McGee's never been submitted. This is a guy with very, very, very good um, submission defense. So if all you have is a one-dimensional grappling game and no cardio, Ramiz Brahimash, same thing. He can just sprawl and brawl you for that first round. You gas up, he wins. That's how he can still do it. Morono is good on the ground. Morono does have a gas tank. Therefore, it's like the way Court utilizes what he still got left to win fights is not likely on the table for him. So I, I would have to say that the great white Morono gets the job done here, possibly by knockout. I agree. I'm right there with you, man. And hey, we got a couple more fights to talk about, everybody. Just real quick, you got to hear from the sponsors. First off, Spectation Sports, Aries FC, Cage Titans, Lights Out MMA, all that good stuff. If you want to see these fighters before they hit Dana White's Contender Series, you find them here. Promo code DIEHARD will save you 20% on your sign up. You guys know all about Bet Openly. I've talked to you about it. Better numbers on everything. 1% juice. You're actually betting with another person. But that brings me to my bigger point here when it comes to Bet Openly. You guys have heard about it. Um, but my big thing, Cody, I don't know if you saw this. I'm planting my flag on Jamal Hill. I put a tweet out. I put a post out on Instagram. And I'm putting yeah. $1 for every like that these bad boys get at UFC throwing 300 on Jamal Hill. I'm going to put it on bet openly. So that way I can give you guys even money on Alex Pereira. So that way we're going head to head. You can come book my action specifically, and I'm going to give you the best number on the market on Alex Pereira, just so that you can do that guys. We're currently sitting at 3870. Uh, this is going to be by far the biggest bet I've ever made. I'm not the guy slinging thousands around every single fight. So this is a, a once in a lifetime, one and only time type of situation. We've got 950 likes on Twitter and we've got uh, almost 3K likes on Instagram. So we're combining those totals. This is going to be up on Sunday. By Sunday, final like count. I'm going to post it up on Bet Openly, and then anybody who wants a piece can come get it and go head to head with me, uh, Jamal Hill, Alex Pereira on UFC 300. So if you guys want to punish me uh, and you want that value on Pereira, get out there and hit that like button on that tweet so the number goes up even higher. Uh, that's going to be a wild night, man. I can't wait to see how that one turns out. Yeah, it's a, oh, it'd be a wild night, man, for sure. You got a big bet on it, and you got a lot of just like fan interactions and bottom yep. line is even if you lose the bet which i expect you to uh no fan no, <laughs> oh no fan, 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 fan. <laughs> you're giving real cedric dumas vibes on this fight too where it's like i'm <laughs> in it's that last week yep, uh, yep. I, I i think if all things were even jamal hill beats his ass right all things are not even uh the ufc was just clinging for a ufc 300 headliner they need something they're desperate every single day more media more fan noise People are saying this card's not that good. Where's our crime jewel? And they try everything in the book. They try to pull yeah. a McGregor. They try to pull a Nate Diaz. They try to pull eight or nine different moves. Nothing's lining up. They're getting desperate. Whenever you see Jamal Hill on social media, he's in terrible shape. Big old gut on him. Trains at a great gym. Don't get me wrong. Joaquin Buckley, like it's it, it's a fine crew of guys. 
but just like he himself is hurt. He hasn't fought in over a year. It's been like 16 months since he fought last. And he pulled out of a fight with Anthony Smith, which I'm assuming he could have won with one leg because it's still being Anthony Smith. The fact that you pull out of a fight with Anthony Smith, you are hella beat up. To tear your Achilles heel, uh, basketball players will tell you, it's a career-ending injury because when you're a yeah. big man, that mobility has gone. So you got a 16-month layoff. You got an Achilles injury. You got a guy that is very noticeably out of shape. And then flip side to that, every picture of Pereira is him jacked in some location with other guys that are jacked, getting one work, <laughs> chomping at the bit. I'll fight this guy. I'll fight a middleweight. I'll fight a light heavyweight. I'll fight a heavyweight. Give me somebody. I'm ready to go. The UFC says, man, we need a marquee matchup to get fans excited. Pereira is frothing at the mouth, <laughs> ready to go. And it's like, who can we throw him in against? And Hill got paid a bag. Now he probably <laughs> needs the bag because he hasn't fought in 15 months. He's yeah. now, he's not old, but he's 32 years old, right? His career is getting piled up on injuries. Him cutting the 40 pounds to make 205, and it has to be 205 dead on the money, title fight, right? Dead on yeah. the money, 205. He's going to have a bad weight cut. He's underprepared. He's on short notice. He's banged up with injuries, and you're putting your biggest bet ever on him. So to me, and I'm a guy that bets stupid parlays, <laughs> it sounds risky to a guy like me. <laughs> All I can wish you is the best, my brother. All I can wish you is the best. I appreciate that. And I'll be honest with you. This whole gimmick started out as like, I've been calling for this matchup for years, right? Like I said, when they both started getting to the top, I'm like, Jamal's going to reign. Well, then he gets hurt and he gives up his belt. No one ever saw Alex getting, you know, the title after that. It was a whole chain of events thing, but it's like, man, like now's the time. The fight is booked. It's happening. So I planted my flag. I kind of got to see it through. Yeah, and uh, fair, fair. I, I wasn't, wasn't expecting the breakdown. The people appreciate the early breakdown, obviously, but you've terrified the shit out of me. So <laughs> <laughs> that said, um, Pray for me. We'll move on for the rest of the UFC Vegas 90 card here. It's Trevor Peak Fight Week, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. The man himself is back. Angry Liam. <laughs> that's that's the best way I can think of Trevor. He looks he looks like a mean Liam picks fights. He's taking on Charlie Campbell. And what a wild roller coaster Peak has been since he's made it to the UFC, man. Um, just an absolute nut. A complete wild man comes forward there is no there's no off button right like he only knows how to reach the gas pedal and his striking is awful i actually thought it was better than it really was because of the way he was murdering people on the regional scene you put him in there with a real striker and you see just just how off that striking really is and the tomahawk that's a fun thing but it's not overly effective and doesn't work great at a high level so it's like oh man i thought we had this animal on our hands in trevor peak and it turns out maybe he's not what i thought he was now his opponent campbell he's an all-action fighter too he's one to know in the ufc this is the guy that was melting duncan on dana white's contender series and then got deaded with one punch he's another just go forward type of guy but damn he's a lot longer he fights using that frame the strikes are long and clean Big clinch knees when he changes ranges. He's going to be three inches taller. He's going to have a two-inch reach advantage. And that, I think, is going to be something that's very, very tough for Trevor Peak to overcome. The one thing, the one thing, Cody, that they're going to just suck me right back in on this live underdog Trevor Peak is he finally went to a good gym. Uh, yeah, I knew you were going to say it. I knew you were going to say it. My boy went to Bang Boy Thai, Dwayne Ludwig. My guy was TJ Dillashaw, Cody. I printed money on TJ Dillashaw when he was in his prime. And the fact that, God, I wish I knew the details. Because if Trevor Peak like, seriously moves in at Bang Muay Thai, he's going to be a killer. Like, if Dwayne can take this, this pile of clay, he's going to sculpt something beautiful. And I can't wait to see what he does. That's a huge improvement compared to where Peak has been in the past. But I don't know if it's enough for this fight i i think peak's got the durability edge campbell's got the physicality the technicality maybe peak has the power advantage oh man i don't know what to do with this fight the plus money is speaking to me on trevor peak but he he's hurt me before cody so i'm not sure what i'm doing here yet i think i'm gonna i'm gonna go ride or die with peak i don't know that i'm betting it I'm going to pick Trevor Peak to pull the upset, man. What do you think of this fight? Yeah, I'm ready to get hurt again. I'll take Trevor Peak <laughs> to uh, get something done. He, listen, it's entirely possible he takes a beating before landing the kill shot. But he's yep. it's on the table. Puncher's that's chance. That's his move. Yeah, that's his move. And Charlie Campbell <laughs> is way more skilled. But Charlie Campbell's got an off switch. And it's been hit. 
And yep. even if you watch him back on the contender series, it's like, oh, damn, dude, he's looking pretty good against Chris Duncan. He's longer. He's got the reach. Boom, Duncan hits him once, puts him over. So, yeah, Duncan's actually on paper, even on footage, you know, better hands, better crisper, better hand speed than a guy like a wild man like Trevor Peak. But the same thing lies that if Trevor's getting hit, he can duck in and just wade one over the top. He can get an uppercut in through the middle. He can split the guard with something. It wouldn't take much to maybe hit Charlie Campbell and hurt him. So yep. as much as he's going to be at a speed disadvantage and the, that length disadvantage and all these disadvantages, again, it is, you know, a puncher's chance type of fight. Peak really does exemplify a puncher's chance kind of guy. And then, yeah, putting him... I like almost everything about it. So we'll talk about the Dwayne Ludwig angle. Huge bang fan, right? He was one of my favorite fighters. He basically has the quickest knockout in UFC history. Masvidal ends up clipping it, but knocks out Jonathan Goulet, a Canadian fighter with no chin. Well, same. Dwayne was the man. K1 experience, the man. Great TJ Dillashaw. He is a genius mind. He's a weirdo, yeah. right? But he is a genius mind. Most he geniuses are. Out. <laughs> that is so true. So <laughs> unbelievably true. The smartest guys I've met in MMA and just other areas, like, yeah, yeah, there's other areas that are lacking, dude. <laughs> the thing is, is that you take a supreme athlete like TJ Dillashaw, a guy that wrestled in college, a guy that had some striking, a guy that is, you know, he very much is that piece of clay, then you can mold him. You gave him footwork. You gave him speed. You gave him all these things. Trevor's not that guy. Trevor doesn't have any footwork. Trevor comes forward and bangs it out. I don't know that eight weeks would be enough to – change yeah. him and even if you were to change him what would that do to him all of his wins whenever he looks good his last fight he didn't look good all of his fights that he has looked good is him crashing the pocket and just trying to like land something a, a hammer fist from a stand-up position if need be whatever it is he will throw it but that is kind of him at his best eight weeks isn't enough to be like hey man don't do that all of a sudden play back counter punch like none of that is stuff that he does he hangs back against charlie he's going to get eaten up by that three inch height advantage and that longer reach advantage charlie also has a nasty jab the problem with trevor is because everything's loopy and everything comes from the side got jabs from taller guys will eat a guy like that up so problematic it's a problematic fight for trevor going to colorado though was actually a fantastic move. I think it'll be a fantastic move. Because the Dwayne angle aside, there's better angles I like. One, it's at altitude, right? So him going to Colorado should allow him to be in career best shape with cardio. And if Trevor Peak can bang it out for 15 minutes without having to take his foot off the gas, then that puncher's chance is going to be there throughout the 15 minutes. You know how good the guy's chin is. You've seen him get rocked. You've seen him get chin checked many of times. He can take a good punch. It's if he can keep putting that pressure on for 15 minutes with gas in the tank, that would help. Him going to Colorado, that touches on that. Other thing is, is that in that camp with Dwayne Ludwig, Chepe Mariscal is in the camp. He's been doing this full camp with Chepe Mariscal. The guy that I did beat not me. know that. I know. Fuck yeah, dude. So so now it's like I'm training with the guy that beat me, who judo black belt, tossed my ass around the ring, countered all of my big loopy shots. A guy that can look you in the eye and shoot it to you straight and be like, this is what you do wrong. Other people can't really do that. What are you supposed to criticize this guy and tell him the shit don't work? It's like the guy that whipped his ass can. And that would be very good for me. A guy that whipped his ass because he has excellent durability, excellent cardio, and is a dead dog. So fighting with another dog in the gym every day, awesome. But you know who else is in that gym? The guy that got Chepe ready to kick the shit out of Trevor Peak, which is Justin Gaethje, who has a fight, coincidentally, one week later. So the whole camp is peaking. Trevor peaking at the same time. And I expect him to be in really good shape. I expect him to be in career best form. The camp he's coming from is the best, if not the second best gym in the state of Tennessee, a gogi. Uh, technically it's in the state of Georgia. Apparently if that's the case, it's the best gym. In the state. Ah, Daniel Levy will probably disagree with me there. Gogi <laughs> is a fine gym. It is a fine, fine facility. The thing is, is that he has two sparring partners, neither of which are in his weight class. Neither of which are full-time fighters. They're guys that go work all day and then, you know, drive to the gym, put on a couple of hours with them. That's not going to get you to the next level. That'll get you a win over Kama Worthy at the Aries Fight Series. That'll get you, you know, a come-from-behind win in the Contender Series in a fight he took a licking in. That'll get you a win over Alex Reyes or somebody like that in the UFC, somebody of low mm -hmm. level. But at some point, he has to leave the confines of his safe place to go somewhere where they're going to beat him up and they're going to push him. And instead yeah. of leaving with a, like a you know, a, a scared puppy dog or running out of there with your tail between your legs, he stuck it out. And Trevor's fairly religious. He leaves back his family, his friends, his church, his support system, and all of his sponsors to go to the fucking mountains and train with Chepe Mariscal and, and, and Justin Gaethje for eight weeks. Big upgrade. 
Yeah, and I, and I hate saying that because it sounds disrespectful to Goki, and I really don't mean to. They are awesome gym, tremendous gym. Trevor needed to, he's at a point in his career where it's like piss or get off the pot, and, th th and he chose to piss. And so I'm hoping he pisses all over Charlie Campbell and knocks him the fuck out. Because that's, that's, that's what we'll need here at plus 165. So Trevor's win condition is probably Trevor by knockout. Um, I think they set the overrunner at one and a half in this fight. I kind of think it could get into that later stages of two before it really gets real greasy. Yeah. But all the same, it's like um, I pulled the biggest coward move. I know you didn't. You and Paul and people that should have talked some sense into me. I went against my boy Nate Landwehr. Such a Dude. coward. Such a coward move. I was this that close to passing, Cody. I was right there with you. I almost passed. He's just such a dog. And Emmers is more skilled. And Emmers rocks the shit out of him, right? And then yeah. it's like... When you're a dog, and I've seen this so many times with guys that I, I – it's a term that gets thrown around a lot. Oh, this guy's got hard. Of it. You know, if you're an actual dog, a Darren Elkins type, a Trevor Peak type, a Dustin Poirier type, a Forrest Griffin type, once you get fucked up and your brain just goes on autopilot mode, that's when they're at their best. There's, There's different levels the of same dog. Way. There's different levels of dog for sure. And, and, and that ability to kind of persevere and come through and break the, the better man – yeah, he smacked him up. So I learned with Nate Landwehr, another Tennessee boy, Clarksville shout out. Uh, yeah, dude, this is like they're, they're tough bred boys out there. They want it. They're willing to fight for it. They got a tremendous amount of power. Trevor Peak's the same way. So to tell me he's in career best shape coming out of a uh, career best camp, so to speak. And it's the last fight on his UFC deal. He started a four fight deal. He's fought the first three. They opted to uh, renegotiate. Trevor opted to take the fight and then renegotiate. Smart man. So he's betting on himself. All, all of that is like, if you're in, I'm in. And at plus 165, yeah, I'm in. So right. I take therapy. Am I expecting to sweat it out? Yeah. Am I expecting to pucker out my butt cheeks at a few points? Yeah. But that's a Trevor Peak fight, right? So the bottom line is he gets his hand raised at the end of the night. Let's go. Let's go. Trevor, these fighters, man, Trevor Peak's got that dog in him. I got that silly goose in me. Let's go. We're going to go for that, uh, that go. plus 160 dog money. I like it. Next fight up, man, we've got Lucas Breschke taking on Walter Walker. <laughs> And man, there's all kinds of shit in this fight. Cody, did you know I, I got death threats from Polish people when I picked against Lucas Breschke a, a couple of like fights ago when he first made his UFC debut? Guys owe in three cents. I feel like I was right. But I, I made some sort of a post about how have you seen that picture of him where he's just like insanely jacked? Like juice to the gills, man. This guy looked like a he was unreal physically speaking. I don't know if you've seen the picture, but everyone knows it. Like once they've seen it, cause he looks nothing yeah. like that no. anymore. He looks absolutely nothing like that anymore. Well, he's like, okay. Ish everywhere. Like for a big flabby fat guy, he he's able to hang in there for 15 minutes. He's got decent cardio. His striking while there's a lot of it, doesn't really accomplish anything. There's no system. There's no process. Like, he just throws a ton of shit out there and hopes to whack you with something big. His grappling, he can't really do much when he gets taken down. He gets up okay, I guess. Like, this guy kind of thrives on, I think, tiring terrible fighters out, like, on the regional scene. When he got to the UFC, can you believe it? They gave him Dylan Potter for Dana White's Contender Series. Yeah. A guy that was fighting at heavyweight, who's really like a 185er or some shit. And... He blew it. He he has a no contest because of a drug test. He's looked like a bag of milk since. But, Cody, if you look on Breshke's Instagram page now, I'm not saying the UFC is pulling a fast one with their new testing that they've got going since you saw the left. I'm not saying the UFC is letting people slide. But suddenly Lucas breshke has got some abs on him. That physique is looking quite a bit better over the last couple of months, very suddenly, for a man who's on a three-fight skid. Now, that might not amount to much because his opponent, Walter Walker, who I believe is Johnny Walker's brother somehow, even though these guys look like, you know, mutant strains of something else, they look nothing alike. They're absolutely, they've got to share like a mom or something because they don't look anywhere near close to each other. He had almost an identical situation. You look back on his run, by the way, god-awful level of competition from this guy. He reminds me of Ilya Latifi. Like, the way he's got that stocky, like, way too much muscle, no neck build on him. That's what this guy reminds me of. He takes people down. He kind of leans on them. He kind of punches them a little bit. His last guy he fought, like, wore him the hell out and, and got him out of there in round four after not doing a whole lot. Like, I'm not impressed with Falter 
at all, man. But one of the guys that he fought um, two fights ago, Cassio, uh, Cassio Jacare or De Silva, whoever he is, that guy is fighting at 170 pounds now. Cassio is 40 years old, man. 40. And you look at the picture of the two of them in the cage together. I posted it. I tweeted it. And it's insane. There's like a full foot difference in height. And this man was backing Walter up to the cage. He was disrespectful, man. He was rib roasting him. He was catching him with overhands. Cody, this 40-year-old man who's fighting at 170 pounds now hit rolling thunder on Walter Walker. It was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. At 11 and 0, the biggest fraud I've ever seen. There's no way Walter Walker is any good. I am so tempted to bet at plus 280 on Lucas Bredschke if he's got abs. Like, if this guy's on the juice, <laughs> I think he'll be able to get up. And I think he'll just keep moving when Walter gets tired. I hate this fight so much, man. It's low level heavyweights to the max. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be disgusting. Dogger pass for me betting. But I I don't know. Maybe you know something about Walter that I'm missing here. <laughs> no, I don't. It's a weird case. So it's like, yeah, he's Johnny Walker's brother, but his name is Walter Walker. Seems like not the most Brazilian. Now there's Johnny Walker. And then Johnny Walker lives in trains in Ireland. And Walter Walker lives in trains in Russia. Like, it just doesn't make any sense yeah. so no i don't know here's the thing though he's a big boy like he's six foot six 265 pounds with an 81 inch reach like he's gigantic he's and bershewski you know he's built like a heavyweight nate diaz like he's skinny fat you know yeah. that would be the term he's skinny fat it's weird but he's only 235 pounds so his problem when he's taking on these bigger heavyweights is He's giving up the size, and guys that are able to take him down have been able to just largely do that. The one that worries me the most would be his fight with Carl Williams. With Carl Williams, my boy, don't get me wrong, but Williams racks up eight easy takedowns on, drops him, racks up eight easy takedowns, and Brzezewski just gasses. His cardio looked solid against Martin Budai. It looked decent against Dylan Potter in a fight that he had originally won by third-round submission. Such bullshit. If you watch that one back, like he ne Potter never taps. Like it's so it's frustrating because Mark Smith's like, you tapped, and Potter's like, I understand you stopping the fight. I was losing, but just for the record, I never tap. Mark Smith looks him at the eyes, it looks him right in the eyes. He's like, Yeah, you did. They show the replay. No point does this guy tap. That's how convinced Mark Smith is that he's right. Is that it's not like, I don't know, man. It looked like your hand. It's just like, buddy, you tapped. And they, they're showing the replay right now, Mark didn't tap doesn't matter it was a third round submission his fight with budai went 15 minutes his cardio looked good he had landed 118 significant strikes in a fight a lot of people thought he won it's the williams fight eight takedowns and he just straight gasses out then he gets knocked out by waldo cortez acosta who is very light in the punching department realm like went 15 minutes with andre Arlovsky, went 15 minutes with chase sherman went 15 minutes with probably a good number of guys that he should have gotten out of there a lot quicker than that so costa's talented but he's not a big power puncher Get smoked in the first round. The eight takedowns, gassing out, no takedown defense, showing that against Williams is not even a big heavyweight. He's a natural two of five for himself, but allowing just the bigger guy to lay and pray you and have no ability to get back up, gassed out from carrying their weight. None of this is a good look. Walter Walker, not very good, not very good. But again, for a guy that's a six foot six, 81 inch reach, 265 pound heavyweight, the simple fact that he finished Alex Nicholson in his last fight in the fourth round. What other guy of that size can fight into a fourth round? That's not the worst look. Nicholson, not great, but tons of experience. UFC veteran, Game Bread FC, bare knuckle MMA veteran, fought in a who's who's of, of guys in the game. So it's not a terrible look. The fourth round finished okay to me. He's only 26 years old. So like we've not nearly seen the best of him at heavyweight. Like this kid's got 10 years before he touches his prime. I can see why he wins. It's just middling heavyweight fight at this price. Ah, that when we talk about who's going to shit in the apple pie, you <laughs> uh, you don't expect it to be Bill Ljo. It's always you, a Walker. You do expect it to be a fucking Walter Walker type. <laughs> me, tries a cartwheel, tries to do something stupid, gases out. UFC debut, undefeated, ballooned up record. Heavyweights, what could possibly go wrong, Clint? <laughs> tons, tons, tons could possibly go wrong at this money line. So he is the pick, but like I'm expecting some greasiness to it. I hear you. Yeah, man. Okay, fair enough. 
Fair enough. I want to see the face-offs. I want to see just how much bigger he is uh, than Breschke, and I want to see how many abs Breschke has. Uh, I'll reserve my right to change my pick to the dog fully uh, when we see those weigh-ins and see what happens there. But you're probably right. He probably just sits on him. <laughs> All right, everybody. We got a couple more. We're almost done here. Ignacio Bahamondes takes on Christos Giagos and Cody. This one's pretty simple to me. The UFC is just straight running this one back. <laughs> Ignacio Bahamondes needs a win. He's 26 years old. He had his three fight winning streak snapped by Luke Dovit Klein, but I like this kid. He's huge for the weight class. Flashy striking, the spinning heel kick, the flying knees. He puts that range to good work. He's got that front kick that I really like. He's got a hell of a chin on him, too. He got checked with a bunch of big shots. He'll have a four inch reach advantage in this spot. And uh, I completely forgot that Christos Giagos existed until they booked him against Daniel Zell Huber. Like, I thought he was, like, Dunzo. I forgot he was on the roster. And the UFC's just like, run it again! We got a tall, skinny Mexican kid for you! They're looking for Ignacio Bahamondes to come out here and kick the shit out of Christos Giagos and probably wrap up a neck when he shoots an ill-timed takedown. It just looks so identical on paper to me. Obviously, those guys are different with slightly different fighting styles. But the method of victory is just right there, man. Like, it, he's going to hit Diagos with some stuff when Diagos can't close the distance. Diagos is a bit chinny. Diagos is a bit gassy. He's big. He's explosive. He'll blitz to try to close the distance. And when that doesn't work, he's going to curl up and die. I, I like big, I like Ignacio Bahamondes here. <laughs> yeah, no, I completely agree. And I'm actually a, a big fan of Christos Diagos. Like, I, I like his work. But on a betting standpoint, he's just too unpredictable. Not unpredictable. He's too much of a, just a one-round front runner. The guy is yeah. physically strong. Built like a beast. Stro solid grappling. Solid wrestling. Solid power in his hands. But everything he does is just like full motion, right? Full explosion. And he tends to gas himself out. Now at 34, cardio never got better. It's at probably at a career low. And just the damage against these younger fighters is starting to pile up on him. Again, when you look at him at his best, knocks out Ricky Glenn, minute and a half. That last fight with Daniel Zellhuber, he rocked Zellhuber early. He put his foot on the gas early. This fight with Thiago Moises, uh, Armin Saruki, and I guess those ones he got smoked out of the water pretty good. Sean Soriano, he's getting his ass straight up kicked as well and end up finishing him early in the second. But watch his fight with Carlton Minus, right? Who's the worst guy the UFC signed in the last 10 years, largely out of this division. Giagos 10 eights him in the first and second round and then straight gases in the third. There's just, there's too much muscle to him, right? Yeah. Like, good looking guy, like look good on the beach, but like in the cage, he's got five minutes. He's Phil Baroni, dude. He's got five minutes to get this thing done or it, it's over. Baja Mondes, meanwhile, I rate this kid. I think he's solid. When you look at his six foot three, 75 inch reach at 155 pounds, oh man, he's not kneeing you. It's not a flying knee to the head. It's not a spinning hook kick to the head. All he has to do is throw it to the body and it hit you in the head. That's how tall he is compared to the rest of the division. He's got solid hips. He's got an okay get up game, very long, solid with the overall output, but there's a way to beat him. And if you look at the two guys that have beat him, Ludovic Klein and Jod Macdesi, they fight very similar. One or two punch at a time, fleet-footed, in and out of the pocket. You need to chase them around. They're very, very precise. They're very, very smart. They're not overextending. They're not looking for a firefight. And they will fight pinpoint for the 15 minutes. Ludovic Klein mixed in three takedowns, very smart. But again, it was allowing Baja Mondes to get, you know, overextend himself and get aggressive because he doesn't like how this fight's going. Time it and come underneath. Now, John McDessie, very smart fighter. I, I don't think he's a world-class guy, but he's very, very smart, very high ring IQ. Ludwig Klein is pretty good. He is a solid fighter. He is a fringe top 15 guy. So losing to him, not the end of the world. You're 26. You're a big guy for this division. You're going to have these setbacks. It's the adjustments that you have to make and the improvements that you have to make. And what I do like about him is even when he loses, he could take a beating. He's got a hell of a chin. Very durable. Solid submission defense. So Giagos' best case is he puts it on Bahamondes for the first. And if that's the case, all oh, you hit that live button button after the end of the first round, baby. If Bahamondes gets his ass kicked in the first, but can simply survive, and you were to get plus money on him, I'd hammer it. Because two and three, he takes over. But in the, case of, in the case of Giagos is 34, and you know this kid's coming off a loss, he's 26, it's entirely possible he beats Giagos right from the get-go. But 
at least you know Kristoff will be his strongest in those opening three, four, five minutes, that opening first round. He might land that big shot like he did against Zell Huber. He may land a couple takedowns, which Ignacio Bahamanes has been known to give up. But the longer that he exerts himself throwing those big punches or landing those big blast doubles or trying to snag up that back and 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 muscle that rear naked choke, that's just going to gas him. And we all know how that goes for Christos Giago. So at some point, this thing's ending ITD for Ignacio Bahamanes, likely by TKO. But uh, could you get or maybe could, by sub? <laughs> maybe by sub because Zell Huber just submitted him. But I also know Zell Huber works a ton on his grappling in Las Vegas. So like apparently he actually is a really sneaky good grappler. Whereas Baja Mendez is looking to just smash you in the fucking head 120 plus times and then have you curl over. So I think again Giago's the knees to the body, the kicks to the body. The the more he causes Giago's to work, the more Giago's will get tired. The more Giago's gets tired, Baja Mendez is not going anywhere. So. Ludovic Klein fought a perfect game plan. McDessie fought a perfect game plan. Um, now you got somebody here in Christos Jagos who's not known for his good game planning. He's known for his fan-friendly, balls-to-the-wild style that the fans enjoy because someone's getting finished in under one and a half. But at 34, it's it's becoming him more often than not. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm glad you agree with me there on that one. I feel like that one's probably one of the easier ones to call on the card, but I'm super excited for Bahamondas, just his career and, and his future in general. So... Definitely like that spot. All right, guys, we got just a couple more fights left. We're going to wrap this thing up here for you. Next up, we've got Morgan Shari taking on none other than Chepe Mariscal, who we talked about just a little bit earlier. And, and Cody, we're beginning a rivalry, Chepe and I. Um, I've bet against this man two times in a row, and twice he has punched me in the dick and taken my lunch money. Like, I cannot beat Chepe Mariscal. I, I knew he was tough. I knew he was more technical than Trevor Peak. But those three knockout losses on his record, man, I thought we were going to get the tomahawk. I thought Peak was going to clip him with one and put him down. Didn't happen. Next fight, I thought, you know what? He got his win. That's great. I know he's kind of on the bottom tier as far as like UFC caliber. I think the UFC is going to do the feeder thing that they do where they're like, okay, great. You weren't supposed to win that last one, but you did. Good on you. Now we're going to sacrifice you to the next guy. And then there with a guy that you know, I, I thought was going to get the better of him. Well, guess what? In the second round, after being up 1-0 on all three judges' scorecards, Jack Jenkins goes for like a throw or some shit and like destroys his shoulder. Chepe maybe would have punched his way back into that one. Round two was closer than round one was, but on the official scorecards, Jenkins was up 1-0 on all three judges' scorecards. I was feeling pretty good about myself there, Cody, but Chepe fucking got me. He got me again. And now here I am. The one and only bet that I've made on this entire card is guess who Morgan Shari? Hey, I like this kid. 19 and 9, uh, 28 years old. He's got a hell of a frame on him. He's very athletic. The big knock on him when he was on like the regional scene before he got to the UFC over in Cage Warriors was that he just was a little too low volume. Like he's very technical, very explosive. He's fast when he decides to go. Big, big, powerful body kicks. I love the body kicks on this kid, but just low volume. He just didn't do enough. And then he gets to the UFC and <laughs> that's not a problem no more. He showed out in his UFC debut. He put that volume issue to rest and he beat the breaks off of zucchini however you say that guy's name in the first round knocked him out got out of there showstopper the big thing for me is i like the way he moves i think someone like chepe who's gonna do the firefight thing who's gonna want to bring the dog out i don't think morgan's gonna play that game i think he can skirt around i think he can move backwards i think i think he'll cut the angles like i think he's gonna frustrate chepe i've been wrong several times very recently on Chepe Mariscal fights, but I think Morgan's the guy to do it for me here, Cody. It's a short price tag. I got minus 148. I'm going to roll the dice one more time here on Morgan and see if I can get it done. Yeah, no, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go with Chepe Mariscal. Damn take that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, taste that plus. No, no, listen, it's not like anybody's right or wrong. We'll have to find out for no, Saturday. No, I school. locked it up, Cody. I bet against yeah, Chepe. He's winning. Like He's yeah, like, <laughs> well, that, that would that would be positive. Chepe's just been a little ATM machine. He comes to the UFC against Trevor Peak, and he was... I mean, it was slight plus money, but they got him at even money. And then at Jack Jenkins, he's plus 170. And now you're going to give him at plus 130 to plus 100 range against Morgan Shari. You can already see money coming in on him. I agree with it 100%. You got a guy in Morgan Shari here, okay, who's only 28 years old. And yet he's got 10 fucking losses. Dude. He's got like nine pro losses and a draw. And then he's got a loss that they considered an exhibition, despite the fact that he was already a 10-fight pro at the time. He's done his fair share of losing. Now, on top of the losing that he's done is look at these methods, okay? So that that 
exhibition fight, he had lost a split decision. Largely decision type fighter, but he lost a split there. Okay, lost to KSW champion Saladin Panasas on a or Palad Parnas, sorry, on a unanimous decision. Ruslan Kurzmaev on a majority decision. Then he had that draw against Marco Kovencic, split decision, loses to Soren Beck, who's not very good, on a majority decision. Beats Lewis Monarch, who's 10 and 4, middle of the road, European journeyman type fighter. But he wins a split decision over him. His loss to Jordan Vukovic, who actually just watched the he just won the cage warrior title on Friday. So he's not bad. Split decision. Then his fight with Paul Hughes, which he lost, was a majority decision. His fight with Daniel Bazin, seven and three, basically nobody. He won a split decision. The volume, Dude, that's, Cody, the volume. That's his, yeah, that's his problem, Clint. His problem is that he's had 10 fights that have gone to split or majority. He wins some of them. He loses some of them. He's got no sense of urgency. He's got no volume. For you to look me in the eye and say his volume issues have been solved because he beat Manolo Zucchini? Are you fucked, man? That guy is awful. Shouldn't be in the UFC. God awful. It's in France. Sherry is the local guy from Paris. They're looking to get him an easy yeah. win. They brought in quite literally a tomato can from Italy. How fitting. And the guy rolls over. And you're going to tell me that this guy's fixed his volume issues? No, 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 no. It was the attitude, though. It was the way he came at it. And I'm like, if that, if he does that again, obviously he's 28 years old. I'm, I'm banking on the young kid figuring it out and turning the corner. You know what I mean? That's fair enough. So then a hardcore guy like me, it's like, okay, just that quick glance, who are the big names on his record? Okay, he's got a win over William Gomez, who's in the UFC now. He's not particularly good. He lost to Saladin, who is good, but is a loss. He saw him back, you know, Bellator type guy. He lost that fight. Dean Truman and Lewis Monarch. These aren't quality wins if you're in the UFC. Jordan Vucinich, Paul Hughes, not very good. Uh, okay, so, so safe to say that a couple guys that are fringe- European level type guys. Those are the guys he's beaten in order to get to the UFC. Okay. Chepe Mariscal. We'll go through his record. Oh, he fought Gregor Gillespie. All right. All right. He went the distance with Bryce Mitchell in 2017. He beat Pat Sabatini. He beat Yusuf Zalal. He fought Johannes and Brito, Steve Garcia, and Sean Soriano. This is all before he came to the UFC. <laughs> For the record, Johannes and Brito was the only guy to knock him out. Uh, him and Steve Garcia have knockout wins over him, right? If you watch those fights, they're early stoppages. He's got a hell of a chin on him. Then all of a he sudden, really he, hits, he hits the right track. He gets a couple quality wins. Gamery Feria, that's a quality win. Trevor Peak would have been a quality win. And then he comes on a career best win over Jack Jenkins. He's got volume for days. Trains that in Colorado with Justin Gaethje. He's got cardio for days. He's a judo black belt. He's got decent takedowns. He never gets stops coming after you. He's not a good fight for a low volume guy like Sherry, who's got some swagger. He, he he hit a punching bag for three and a half minutes in front of all of his people. Yeah, he's gonna have some swagger when he's got Chepe in front of him. It's a problem. Now, when you mention you're like, oh, I'm getting Chepe picks wrong. He's a hard guy to pick because you don't expect him to be continuously getting better. But he's still only 28. Before he came to the UFC, he fought Holy seven shit, guys. Point. He fought seven guys that were in the UFC before he got there. So did it the right way. Did it the hard way. Trained to engage. He trained with Peak. All these guys. Trevor Peak landed numerous bombs on him. Watch the fight. Numerous bombs. Those bombs have folded. Oh, he's thirty-one. Else. Jeffrey's thirty-one. Oh, is he? Okay, my bad. I overstated. That. He's thirty. 31 I was like, old. no way. I was like, how did I, I miss? Know. He was twenty-eight. <laughs> that would be nice if he was. Uh, 31 years old, that's considered, I remember I you take all the top 15 guys in the UFC and girls, take all the top 15 that the UFC tells you ranked and crunch the numbers on it and the average age per top 15 fighter in the UFC, 31, 32. That's you at your best. That's you when you get the title. After 31, 32, it's where the, you know, the regression starts. Prior to that age, it's still, you're still learning. You're still making those mistakes. So again, okay, 31, he's not old. He's not young. But this is Chepe at his best on a five-fight winning streak, cashed two straight underdog tickets, solid cardio, solid durability, solid experience, taking on a guy that's beaten a, a, a few fringe European... Who's his best win? Have we discussed this already? Who do you think is his best win on paper? We, Don't tell me the guy did last fight. It. And, and you destroyed it. That's <laughs> Well, it's just he's the favorite over a guy that's legitimately earned two no, you're solid right. victories and keeps right. coming forward. And again, and I is already that, hate it. Is that a solid camp? The other guy still trains in France. Who does he train with? Do you know any of his training partners? Or is Chepe's in with your boy, Dwayne Ludwig? Been oh, with Dwayne God. Ludwig for a few I years. I didn't know he was with Dwayne Ludwig, by the oh, way. No. You told me that. Yeah. That was breaking news here on the show. Damn it. <laughs> do I 
Oh, I hate this pick so much already. <laughs> the, the, the way he fights, if you were to tell me Chepe was a minus 200 favorite in this spot, which I wouldn't even call it crazy, but if that was what the line was, then it's like, ah, oh, dude, I don't know. I mean, Cherie is actually not bad. He's sorry. I think I got it confused. Cherie is 28. He's the younger fighter. He's still yeah. got 25 pro fights, and he's lost 10 of them against guys that wouldn't get a sniff of Chepe's jockstrap. So, yeah, I got to think my boy Chepe, he's an underdog plus money. I, I can't look away. I can't look away. I really can't. Oh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Sounds sounds tough, but I think Chepe maybe burns you one last time for good for just for good measure. I'm just never betting against him ever again, man. That's it. Win or lose, like this is just gonna be it. Like after that breakdown, the slaughtering I just got on camera, like it's just done, man. We're not fucking with Chepe no more on this show. <laughs> he's he's a tough son of a bitch, and I he always is. preach this because we get a lot of guys like. Uh, Andre Petrosky, right? It's like, I want a guy who will fight for my dollar. A guy who's sprawled out on the canvas looking up at the ceiling lights and then one of those hammer fists somewhat wakes him back up and he starts fighting again. That's who I like to put the money on. Petrosky is a, he runs himself head first into your hippo. Although that cut was nasty. I, I, I thought he was half faking it. The thing was like he took a, a tomahawk in the head. You know, so you're not calling any of these guys, these guys quitters, but Chepe is the kind of guy that 15 minutes, down a round, down two rounds, whatever need be, he needs to go for it. And with Cherrier, it's a lot of low volume, split decision, majority decision against guys that Chepe would, would murder, I think. Chepe, meanwhile, he's a put your foot on the gas. It's a small cage. Your Paris crowd's not there anymore. Your shots is not getting this massive pop, and you got a, a dog frothing at the mouth trying to get on a bone. So, yeah, I, I, plus money. Give me Chepe. All right. All right. Oh, we are going head to head on this one. And this one is much more convicted than I'm comfortable being. Uh, all right, everybody. Next up, we have got Alexander Hernandez, the great ape, taking on Damon Jackson, the leech. And uh, damn, man, talk about, talking about guys I'm just done with, right? Like, <laughs> Chepe, it's going to be after this card. I'm done with. I'm done with Alexander Hernandez, Cody. I keep expecting this guy to get it together. I keep expecting him to turn the corner and become something. He's got all of it. He's huge. He's strong. He can wrestle. He made his UFC debut by blocking the – knocking the block off of a guy who's like a top five guy in the world. Like – how did Alexander Hernandez not pan out? I don't understand, but I keep losing money on him and I'm done. He's a minus 200 favorite here against the leech. And, and man, the problem is, is I'm starting to see the crack show in here on Damon Jackson. He's 35 years old. He's taken a lot of punishment, a lot of wear and tear on the guy. He's definitely getting up there. But, like, you watch his last fight, and it's Billy Q just kind of beating the brakes off of him like Billy Q tends to do when he's on, you know, in his flow state doing what he does. And Damon Jackson's hanging with him. He doesn't go out on his shield. He, he goes the full 15 minutes. That's after getting knocked flat by Dan Ige, right? Like, this guy this guy pounded out Pat Sabatini in the first round. He's got power. He's got jujitsu. He can wrestle pretty well. He scrambles. He can go a full 15 minutes. Hernandez, I'm going to give the wrestling advantage. I'm going to give the power advantage, but we all know what happens. This guy's a Conor McGregor S gas tank. If he gets into round two, he's just not the same guy. And I think the big thing for Alexander Hernandez is he's a bully. He's got to have that confidence. He's got to have that unwavering self belief in himself that he's going to beat the guy across the cage from him. Then he performs. I think he's lost that, Cody. Like, I think the amount of L's he's taken recently, especially finished ones, kind of have him questioning his life choices a little bit and if he's in that kind of a, a headspace he's just not going to be the same guy I, I think hernandez has probably got to get damon jackson out of there in round one and if he doesn't damon's probably going to choke him out yeah it's entirely possible you completely nailed it with alexander hernandez he's a head case he's got all the skills he's built like a brick shit house he's a very powerful you know well put together athlete power for the benil darius knockout was a four i mean four arm chopped the guy across the face and knocked him out in like 44 seconds on a UFC debut. He's got the package. And when he was talking shit to Donald Cerrone, that was mentally Ooh. him at his best. The thing is, is cold. that his skills didn't match what his mentality was. And even though it's you need that self-belief, Cerrone took it all away, man. He beat the shit out of him so badly that he's been questioning himself since then. And yeah, he's won. Francisco Trinaldo fight, terrible fight. He lands 25 significant strikes, greased out a very close decision in Texas, which is his home state. Bad fight. His fight with Drew Dober. Bad fight. Knocked out. His fight with, uh, with uh, Tiago Moises. Bad fight. Hanato Moicano. Billy Q. Bill Aljeo. Like, there's 
there's moments in there where it's just like he just doesn't believe himself and it, it doesn't correlate to the skill. He's no good. But I'm not fully ready to write him off. Again, he's not young. He's not old. He's 30 years old. But he's kind of a, a coach at Factory X Muay Thai now. So he spends a lot of time, you know, training the fighters, coaching these fighters, cornering these fighters. And the gym's just on a massive run right now. They've got Brendan Roy Val. They've got Yusuf Zalal. They're churning a lot of quality guys. And again, he's got a part of that. So he's maturing. He's not this young kid that just needs to think he can beat everybody up. Is that he's a little more analytical and a little bit smarter. He's trying to fight that way, but it's taking away from who he is, which is explosive nastiness. Now he's trying to fight a little more conservative, and he hasn't quite found that balance. But the last two fights, I honestly think, have been a lot better. A win over Jim Miller, that means something. Miller is on one hell of a roll right now. And the fact that he landed 108 significant strikes over Jim Miller, stuffed the takedowns, his cardio checked out, training at altitude has clearly worked, he fought smart, and it's a quality victory. And then to lose to Bill Aljeo, had Bill Aljeo won this past weekend, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It would look like a nice loss. It doesn't because Bill didn't look particularly good. But all the same, it's like it was a very high pace fight. Yeah. And <laughs> Hernandez landed 75 in that fight. Hernandez tried to do the best. It is a decent level of competition. But yeah, it just doesn't look like he's ever going to break into that top five or top 10 like we once thought of him. Against Damon Jackson. Damon Jackson's a lot slower than him. He's a lot more plotting than him. He doesn't quite have the durability that he does. But yeah, he's one of these guys I'd classify as a little more of a dog. Like one guy doesn't really believe himself anymore. And Damon Jackson overbelieves himself. He's got a primitive enough skill set that he shouldn't have all these wins and quality wins. And even when he loses, again, for the most part, yeah, Dan Ige knocks him out. But for the most part, the guy can go a hard 15 if need be. Been knocked out a few times and beat up a few times. But so is Hernandez. So it's kind of just who's feeling better that night, who lands the shot. We got to look at who's got the skill and who's got the athleticism and who's got the power and who's got these things. And it would lead me to believe that Alexander Hernandez wins this fight. And the pick is going to be Alexander Hernandez. But again, that's why I picked Jamal Emmers over Nate Landwehr last time. It's like skill and athleticism, speed, and all these different things goes right out the window when the other guy just starts dog walking you backwards. And Damon Jackson may have a bad first round and then find his groove, whereas Hernandez may have a good round and the, the wheels fall off. It's what he's known to do. So the, the picker is Hernandez, but one of these guys that you just, you can't have a ton of confidence in. You can't, yeah. you can't look at yourself in the mirror and be like, we're making some money on Hernandez tonight. Cause it's like, maybe <laughs> if, if he's looking himself in the mirror and saying that to himself, I'm in, but he might be like, oh shit, a bit off more than I could chew again. And, and then yep. that's the version you don't want. This is one of those guys you have to listen to the interviews on. People say I listen way too much into what the fighters are saying. You have to on a guy with a head case like Hernandez. Um, so I'm going to listen to the fighter interviews, see where he's at head-wise. I may find myself to like a knockout prop or something. I've got a hard time seeing this fight go 15 minutes, man, one way or the other. I, I think he can knock out Damon Jackson. I will have my trigger finger ready to go on the live bet button, though. Like if it gets into that second round, third round, I'll be watching Damon Jackson here closely. I'm with you, though. Pick is Alexander. I'm not betting him at minus 200. I, I can't. I can't. <laughs> Um, and here we go, everybody. The moment you've all been waiting for. The reason I reached out to my guy, Cody. Main event time. We've got Brendan Allen taking on our boy, Chris Curtis. The action man is back. They are running it back. I love this so much, man. Um, this is this is such an awesome fight. So Brendan Allen, obviously you guys know the first fight. Cody and I both backed up the Brinks truck on our guy Chris Curtis and had a wonderful night when he knocked out Brendan Allen that night. So we're a couple of years down the road. Brendan Allen has made a whole lot of adjustments, a whole lot of changes. He's really grown as a fighter. His striking has come a long way. His grappling, his MMA grappling has come a long way. The guy is deadly now and he's on an absolute tear. I am... I've got nothing but respect for what Brennan Allen has done to this point in his career. And he's still just 28 years old. So he's still coming into his prime and he's on a ridiculous win streak right now. Just finishing people. The finish, uh, you know, deep in the fight against Paul Craig was extremely impressive. The Andre Muniz finish was extremely impressive. He's beating ground game specialists. But the one thing that I've always had a problem with Brennan Allen, the durability. Now, Chris Curtis, he's no spring chicken. He's 36 years old. One of the things he's had a hard time with is adjusting his style because moving up to 185, he hits harder. Uh, but he has been extremely open about the fact that he has to stay heavier on his feet for that. So these guys that are like skirting the outside of the cage and running away from him, you know, the, the Kelvin Gaslam, the Jack Hermanson fight specifically, he can't catch the guys because his style is must be rooted, can't take me down. And 
he actually hit me up, man. He, he was DMing me about like the Nasser Dinamava fight and stuff like that, asking me to watch it back and give my opinion on it and stuff like that. And um, one thing he talked to me about is that he's trying to now blend his styles, where at 170, he was a little lighter on the feet, and that led to a lot of success. And then at 185, he's been heavier on his feet, but they found the weakness. He's trying to kind of blend it to make it where he's effective both ways. And I have faith in my boy, Cody. That's kind of all it comes down to. I've been a ride or die guy with Chris Curtis since he made it to the UFC. And I've bet on him over and over and over again. I had a really big bet on him in the Mark andre burial fight. Was a little nervous uh, when that thing went to a split decision. But I felt like he uh, was the right side. Got his hand raised. I'm worried about the adjustments that Brendan Allen has made. I'm worried about the improvements, a young kid that's that dangerous in his prime. But I think the small cage helps Chris Curtis, and I still think that durability is a problem. I got to run it back, man. We're free rolling here. We got a bigger number last time, but I'm going to just sack up and bet Chris Curtis again this weekend, man. What what do you make of this one? I'm waiting. I need to hear your thoughts on this one. Yeah, I mean, I can see being a lot harder than the last time around, but I think I think the pick is still Chris Curtis. And again, Chris Curtis has been my boy for a long time. When he came to the UFC, he was already 33 years old. He already had 30 pro fights. He got he sweet chin music to guy in the contender series and didn't get a contract. Like everybody gets a contract. What the hell, man? That was he the just, most he got Okay, I'm brought, I'm glad you brought that up because Liam, my boy, tweeted that just earlier today and I was like, he got robbed, man. Like what are you doing not signing that guy? Yeah, and that's me and Chris Curtis and Sam Alvey uh, took a three hour car ride one time from like Lethbridge, Alberta to the Calgary airport because he fought for Z Promotions Fight Night. And then uh, me, him, and the cut man, Rod Wingrove, the four of us shared the car ride back. And he's highly intelligent, loves to fight. And if you talk to him, he thinks he's been getting shafted his entire career. And you'd bring up stuff like, dude, remember when you fought Forrest Pets, the meat cleaver? He's like, dude, I got so robbed in that fight. It's like you fought Bilal Muhammad, you fought Nashon Burrell. For the record, his fight with Nashron Burrell is one of the dirtiest robberies you'll ever see in the sport of MMA. But it's like he understands that he's been getting bad decisions. And it's like he has a slow style, right, where he picks his punches. The guy's got nearly 40 fights at this point. He's 36 years old. He's fighting in the UFC. They want to see him stand in the center of the cage and throw down with Mark andre Barrio. He's too smart for that. He's sparred too many high-level guys. He's been in too many wars that he picks his punches and he waits. And it's not, if he knocks out Phil Hawes or he knocks out Brandon Allen, people jump up in the air and they cheer. It looks really good. If he sits and he waits and he plays a smart game and those punches don't materialize into that one big knockout punch, then people criticize him. Yeah, Jack Hermanson didn't want to fight him. He ran away. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kelvin Gaslam, the headbutt in the second round changes everything. The main thing is, is that he needs you to engage him and he's going to pick and choose his punches and be pretty. But he's, I, and I've always said this, he is built for five round fights. Because he waits and chooses and kind of waits a little too long. In a three-round fight, you can find behind, you can fall behind on the eight ball a little bit. In a five-round fight, he's going to have chances to land those punches. When he lands those punches, generally does some pretty heavy-duty damage. Now, um, when you look at Brandon Allen, right? And you, this is another great point you mentioned. It's like, hey, his last fight, he submits Paul Craig. It's like, oh, dude, quality submission victory. He, he choked out Bruno Silva after dropping him. Ah, I went over Bruno Silva now apparently mean fuck all. God damn, is he bad. My God. He is shot, man. Andre Muniz, they're trading, grappling back and forth. Brandon Allen's conceivably not necessarily dominating. And then, you know, he submits a quality guy and Andre Muniz. Submits Christoph Jocko. The reason why he falters against a guy like Chris Curtis is because Chris Curtis in his 92% takedown defense ratio don't allow him to get these fights to the ground. The first time he fought Chris Curtis, he couldn't take him down. Therefore, he has to strike with him. And he's longer, and he's faster, and he's younger. But you get stepping in with this combination. When he doesn't counter, when he Philly shells and he sits, he's just downloading info. And he's downloading info. And then, boom, he cold cocks you with a counter. If you got the durability, you'll take it. If you don't got the durability, he's going to put you over. We saw that last time against Brandon Allen. We put him over. This time, I'm thinking it's much of the same. Last two things we're going to touch on real quick. One, Chris Curtis is coming into this fight short notice. So maybe that's another reason people are a lot higher on Brandon Allen. But the last time he fought Brandon Allen, he was also coming in on short notice. So that's that better for him. He, it is he better for him. He seems to go him. to war better on short notice. It's better for him because you don't go every night thinking, oh, this guy's going to do this, and this guy's going to do this, and this guy's going to just show up and do what you do best, which is sprawl and brawl. Stuff his takedowns. You stuff 23, state, uh, 23 straight Reginaldo Viara uh, takedown attempts. Sorry, not Reginaldo Viara, but... Um, the Black Belt Hunter, Rodolfo Vieira, my bad. 
23 takedown attempts. He had stuffed them all. When he fought Brendan Allen, stuffed them all. He's got excellent takedown defense. He's just got to go out there and utilize it again. The next thing is that Brandon Allen and Chris Curtis trained together in Las Vegas. And by all accounts, Chris Curtis kicked his ass. So when they offered Chris Curtis the fight the first time against Brandon Allen, he was like, yeah, does Brandon want to fight me? I doubt it. And they're like, no, Brandon said he would fight you. So Chris is like, okay, I'm in. And he just knocks him out. And he's very adamant, like, just like when we were training, old boy. Now they're offering it again. It's like, ee! Confidence means something. Chris knows I beat this guy's ass. If he can't take me down, he's going to have to strike with me. And if he strikes with me, he'll get out to an early jump. He might win the first round. He might even win the first two rounds. At some point, I'm going to counter homeboy and knock him the fuck out. And I, and, and I do feel like that is still back on the table. So got to go with Chris Curtis, get the job done. If you're looking at who's going to be better in two, three years down the road, yeah, you got a 28-year-old Brendan Allen on a long winning streak getting better, making improvements. His grappling looks amongst the best in the division. His wrestling probably is better from the last time he fought Chris Curtis. His striking is definitely better from the last time he fought Chris Curtis. He's making improvements. Curtis, these fights have not been all that good. His last fight with Barrio, he landed 140 significant strikes and everybody talked about how boring it was. What more can he do for you? But he's not yeah. going oh, for it. Fight. His fight with Nasruddin Imovov, you know, he's getting tripled up 57 to 26 before the, the head clash. But it's not, it's a kind of a flat performance for him. Kelvin Gaslam fight. I actually thought he could have won had he not gotten that headbutt in the second round. Could have given that fight to him. But again, it's like Kelvin was just outworking him a little bit. And that's his issue is he's a slow starter and he downloads info and he waits and he waits and he waits and he waits. And in three round fights, it can escape from him a little bit. In a five round fight, I've seen him fight five round fights before. Trust me, he'd be good to go. So got to go with my boy, Chris Curtis. He fought. Hell yeah. I'll bring up the exact fight. It was a, such a good fight. Such a good fight. He fought uh, Matt Dwyer, right? Fight night nine in a five-round fight, 185 pounds. Matt Dwyer is a UFC veteran um, out of a top gym, uh, Toshido MMA, training partners with Roy McDonald, training partners with Shane Campbell, David Lees is, is head coach, like, solid fighter. In the first two rounds, it's like, dude, this Chris Curtis guy, not that good. Like Dwyer's really long. He's six foot four, long ass reach. And he's just smacking him with the reach and moving, smack him. And Chris is just sitting there. It's like, dude, this guy didn't come to fight. I don't know what the hype on Chris Curtis is. Three, four, and five. It is the bloodiest fight I've ever seen in my life. I've never seen a, a fighter lose that much blood in a fight before as Matt Dwyer, whose face was wrecked. Like he had been in an auto collision and had gone straight out of his windshield into a fucking pine tree. Like his face was wrecked. And Curtis ends up winning the decision, but five round fights, his style is built for it. And I do expect him Absolutely. to walk away with a, with a slight edge here. So, yeah, I mean, I got, I wouldn't say half a dozen underdogs I like on this card, but five underdogs I like on this card. And again, like you were talking about, you know, um, links dog pick. It's like, because you're playing with plus money, you just got to hit, you know, if you went 50, 50 on your dog picks, it would still be profitable. So maybe we tone it down, maybe wait for weigh-ins, but there's value on this card. Absolutely, man. I said last week that if you blindly bet every single dog on the card, I think you'd make money. I think that worked out last week. I think that would have been true. I kind of wish I had just put my balls on the table and actually done that because I think it worked. I don't think it's quite that way this week, but there's a lot of very live dogs here on this card. Man, I appreciate it, Cody. This was a hell of a fun show. It is always fun talking fights with you. Unfortunately, we're both uh, old men with lives and we don't get to uh, do it often enough. But I really appreciate you chilling here with me tonight and talking fights. Um, man, I always give my guests the floor at the end of the show. If you got stuff going on, if you want to tell people where they can support you, um, feel free, man. Let, let them know what's up. Any sponsor shout outs, whatever, have at it. Yeah, nothing really, dude. I just appreciate you giving me the platform because I'm so busy, man. And I'll be honest with you. I had the baby Friday. My wife had the baby Friday. She had some complications. We spent three days in the hospital. We just brought her back today at like 2 o'clock. I was like, I oh got to go. Yeah, and then we've, we've moved. You could have canceled on me for that. <laughs> thought about it, but also I'm a, I'm, one, I'm a man of my word. I said I was going to do it. I'm going to do it. The other thing is we've been meaning to do this for a while, you know, and it's yeah. always like, does this date work? Maybe, and then it doesn't. Does this date work? No, it doesn't quite work. So I said I was going to do it, and I really want to do it. And even though she was kind of like, are you sure? It was like 100%. So I made the like half hour drive back to the old place because it has the studio still set up and I haven't torn it down yet. And I was just like, I'm going to pump this show out. So thank you. And then also just a shout out to one of your sponsors, Spectation Sports. Hell yeah, dude, sign up. Use Clint's promo code, 20% off. You're going to be doing lots of tape study using Spectation Sports. And I'm actually going to go to the Aries show this weekend and call the action there. Luis Pena, Dedrick Sanders, waiting for your lineup on that. Um, 
yeah, it's it's a dope card. So I'm gonna go to Chattanooga, check that out. And uh, Spectation Sports is doing some really cool stuff. So helping they guys really like Clint, helping guys like me. Huge shout out to them. Huge shout out to everybody that joined the chat and to all the Clint's viewership. Just again, you know, you've done an awesome job of building a cool community. And uh, whether they're people that were familiar with me before or they didn't, thanks for spending a couple hours of your time tonight listening to some fight picks. Hell yeah, man. Thank you so much, Cody. Shout out to the real uh, MVP, your wife, for uh, doing all that and then letting you come on the show here with us tonight. So make sure she we send our love to her. Hope she uh, recovers quick and everybody is happy, healthy. Guys, thank you so much for watching the show this evening. Home of Fight, as you know, subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the like button. You know the schedule. We'll be back later on this week. Total takedown and undefeated post way in show later on on Friday. Have a great week, everybody. Cash those tickets and let's roll.